Welcome to Real Estate Coaching Radio, starring award-winning real estate coaches and number one international best-selling authors, Tim and Julie Harris. Real Estate Coaching Radio is the nation's number one daily radio show for realtors who demand authentic real-time coaching. Get ready for fluff-free, unfiltered, full-strength honesty about what's truly working to get you into action, helping others, and making money now in today's real estate market. Now to our hosts, Tim and Julie Harris. Three, two, one, and we're back. And uh, those of you of VXP Realty, I'm meeting with someone. Um, I don't remember your name. What's your name again? Brent. Put that mic up to your mouth. Oh, Brent. <laughs> Brent. Brent's this little agent. He's just getting started. He's a new agent from California, from Sacramento. Is that right? That's right. How Sacramento, you, California. How, how do you spell your last name? Is it Govey? <laughs> Govey. Govey. That's pronouncing it. <laughs> People do that. Govey. It's <laughs> Go. So we're sitting here, and guess where? Back in Puerto Rico, back at the Ritz Carlton, overlooking what is an absolutely stellarly gorgeous day. I can barely concentrate. Palm my... trees, blue sky, the ocean, the Caribbean. It's beautiful. It Although is. here on this side of the island, it's the Atlantic, right? Uh, yeah, technically, sure. Yeah. But it is beautiful. I I'll gotta stop looking, or I'll stop. Lo- I'll start losing concentration. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you're having a nice vacation down here, I take oh, it. Totally. What's the so? What are the top three things that have surprised you and your lovely wife Kathy so far from being down here? Oh, it's um, it's the closest thing to Maui I've ever been to. We love mm-hmm. Maui. We go every year, um, and this is just phenomenal. I absolutely love it. But we are at the Ritz. It's pretty nice. Well, even outside of the Ritz, though, there's some there's some places that are around here that if you drive just fifteen or twenty minutes That's either great. direction, are some of the most beautiful. Uh, you know, I got to stop looking. It's literally oh, causing yeah. me not to be able yeah. to concentrate. Well, so we're pretty. also down at Palmas Del Mar with mm-hmm. Gene and Susan, and we see St. Thomas across the way. So I know. Beautiful, beautiful, and everyone loves St. Thomas. It's a great place. So uh, um, a guy that we're becoming friends with, uh, Brendan Bichard, I probably pronounced his name wrong down here, which a lot of you guys have heard of. Um, anyway, he said something I thought was really nailed the, you know, put made the point of why you moved down here. Because he said in his mind, that you have to, you only get to enjoy living in a place like this when you're at a certain age, right? You can't do it before that because after all, that's not how life's supposed to work. You're supposed to, you know, suffer until you're, you know, I don't know when, and then you can maybe move to some place that's like this. And he's had the epiphany, why don't I just do it sooner? You know, which is really the bottom line. And if you can, you should, because the quality of life down here, you know, here's the funny thought, you're from California, so you guys don't suffer winters. But Julie and I, when we originally moved out of Ohio, for like five or six years, every time it would be like October, we would literally start thinking it was going to be cold like within two weeks. Oh. <laughs> yeah, you don't get that. You don't shake it. But down here, it's so beautiful year round. It's, I anyway, mean, it's like heaven. Oh. Hey, was, we're loving it. It's great. Well, I'm loving having you guys here. It's great. Thank you. So we're going to talk about a whole variety of topics. Okay. And, and um, I think as we're approaching this, we should probably talk about this from your origination story you're sort of how you got started not in real estate because maybe that's not like how you got specifically involved in exp because your story is not so dissimilar to other people where they sort of started out maybe a little skeptical and then they sort of like realized it was something special Um, and so by the way podcast listeners if you're listening if you haven't figured out yet there's gonna be a lot of exp realty talk on here so if you're not ready for that um well listen anyway because there's gonna be a lot of things on here that'll educate you and motivate you so what was your, uh, your your origin story for getting involved with EXP? Well, I was 12 years at REMAX, loved it. Eight years at Keller Williams, loved it. But I am the kind of guy who's happy pretty much where I'm planted, where I am. And four years ago, we got a call from a good friend of mine from Dallas, Texas, Sheila Fairsran. She's like, oh my gosh, Brent, have you heard about this new company, EXP? And I'm like, no, I haven't. Mm-hmm. And so she said, oh, you've got to check it out. They're going to change the world and all this crazy stuff. I think there were 1,200 agents at EXP throughout the U.S. and Canada at the time. And uh, I think we were a $50 million company, and today we're over $3 billion. So she was right, by the way. But So that was my origin story. She asked me to check it out. I did. I was shocked. I was blown away. I mean, blown out of my chair, because I'm a very open-minded person. I looked at the facts. There's, there's nothing like it in the world if you're in real estate. Nothing. So when and, uh, this was what, how many years ago? Four and a half? Three years and 11 months and three weeks ago. Approximately. Approximately. <laughs> In fact, seconds. what's the date today? What's the date today? Do we know? I don't know. 
What's the date? I haven't Let's set see. my watch this date. Today's the 25th. So it has been. It was four years on the 21st. Honey, we didn't even have a celebration. You're it's having been, it now. You're at the it's Ritz Carlton. It's been four years. And why did you just call me honey? Oh, no, I'm just uh, kidding. My wife is in the room. Yes, yes. <laughs> For those of you podcast listeners, <laughs> I do not ever call Tim honey. And I didn't right there. There's only one honey, and she's to my right. Uh, so I got you distracted. So you remember back almost four years ago when you were choosing EXP over Remax? Julie and I were with Remax too for a decade. Mm-hmm. So when you decided to leave and go to EXP, like why hadn't you done that sooner? It's not like EXP hadn't been around for longer than four years. You know, well, I've never heard of it. No one ever presented the. No. That, so that's a really that's actually pretty amazing. Let's let's yeah. hover there. So no one had ever presented it to you, even though you are one of the top agents and your team is still one of the top teams in the country, mm-hmm. you know, in your, in your California world and right. everyone knew who you were. But no, well, one I, don't, I don't know about that, but, we, you know, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, but We've done that, well. Yeah, right. So you weren't, a, you know, somebody no one had ever heard of before. Yeah. Point being is no one had approached you, no one had ever approached you, or the people that approached you did it poorly. No one had ever, I've never heard the letters EXP. And my first sole initial response is that's a terrible name for a real estate company. Like, what is that? Examine your zipper EXP. I don't know what it was. By the way, I love those letters now. Mm-hmm. It's like Google or Yahoo or NEC or, you know, IBM or CB or C21. Everyone uses acronyms. It just sounded weird because I'd never heard of it. Now I love it. It's my $3 billion dream. Exponential. I mean, yep. that's, yeah. That was actually an interesting question Julie and I had, too, a couple of years ago, is what the heck does it stand for? And they're like, whatever you want it to stand for. <laughs> right, right. And by the way, I left Remax, you know, 12 years ago. It, then I went to Keller Williams. I'd been there for 12 years. I went mm. to Keller Williams for eight years. So Keller Williams was the company I left that I was madly in love with. But once I understood the model, there was no way I could stay. Impossible. Um, I, I don't, the only reason people aren't at EXP is they really don't understand the model or they simply have not taken the time to really understand the model other than give it a quick cursory look and then listen to their team leader, their OP, their regional manager, whoever is influential over them to say it's garbage, it's junk. And I could tell you this, almost every uh, agent who was selling 40, 50, 60 homes a year that left with me four years ago is a millionaire through EXP. Agent after agent after agent after agent has over a million dollars in our NASDAQ stock. I mean, literally, they didn't go recruit a bunch of people. They just changed where they sold real estate. I cannot tell you how many times I get the email. When it's 45 a share, I'm a millionaire. When it's 53 a share, I'm a millionaire. I get this all the time, and they're so grateful. So why is it, given the fact that the model's proven, that there's not just one or two? Easy question. Go ahead. Because people are Lakers fans. They're Yankees fans. They're Boston Red Sox. I will die a friend who's a Seahawks fan. I hate the Seahawks. I like Russell Wilson. He's an impressive guy. I'm a, I'm a New England Patriots fan. People, real estate is the same way. I will die at Century 21. I will be a Sotheby's agent. till the, And they just get loyal to their brand, which is insane. Be loyal to your family, man. Check it out. Understand you are passing on a fortune. This is the Apple, the Google of our time in real estate, and you're missing it because you're too doggone close-minded. You got to look at it. Take a deeper dive. If you're not excited and you, and you can't go to bed where you can't sleep, you simply don't understand the model. That's my opinion. It's like Jay Kendrick. Fact, because you're not that or you're not bright. Which and you, I don't think it's that you're not bright. Which, well, you're, what Jay said, once you see it, you can't unsee it. Yeah. But there are EXP insomnia. Oh, <laughs> More coffee on the way, yeah, yeah. but there were, but there are uh, people that refuse to see it, right? Right. And I think the refusing to see it aspect of it, it's fear based. Have you thought like they're fearful of something? What do you think I, they're fearful I, of? For some of them, yes. Here's what I. Do you want to know what I really think? I think people have bought in. They own a franchise. It. It's Century 21 or Remax or Keller Williams or Sotheby's or some Berkshire Hathaway. And they're just in bed. They're, they've invested hundreds of thousands of dollars. Their leaders are like, they can't, they don't want to believe it because then they got to somehow disentangle themselves because they're bought into a system at whatever brokerage it is, Christie's or, or you know, whatever, again, whatever brokerage. And guess what? Um, they don't want to even admit there's something that could possibly be better. We can take care of the. Yeah, uh, we'll we can take a we'll tray. Stab you in. Recording. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you. No problem. Thank you. <laughs> they just brought coffee to the room. We yeah. want to stop the yeah. clinking. Yeah. So um, there's an old saying, and I don't know who said this, and I need to Google it. And one of you guys listening can Google it and, and save me the effort. But 
when the going gets tough, the smart leave. And, and the secondary version of that is there's a difference between quitting and quitting while you're ahead. So there's, it's a fascinating, what you're expressing, and I see this happening a lot with coaching clients, is they'll start doing things in their business that absolutely positively do not lead to more transactions or more profit, but they've just been doing them for so long that even though there's no tangible results from it, they just keep doing it because they're afraid to not do it. So it's that fear that's fascinating because it keeps people away from... Absolutely. Yeah, and you can, we can deep dive in Tony Robbins and Dr. Phil it to the end of the earth. But at the end of the day, you said it perfectly. At, you owe it to your family. You, you owe it to your, you, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> you owe it to your, um, you know, your grandkids and your grandkids after that. And if you don't have a family or you don't have any grandkids, you know, you owe it to yourself. Yeah. And it's, and it's uh, at the core of it, I always, I'll ask you this question opposed to asking it and answering it myself. What is at the root of why people uh, start any business or decide to be in business themselves? What, is, what eventually is the, re- the motivation? Not primarily, but eventually. What becomes the motivation for them do it, taking the risk? I think a lot of times there's a lot of reasons, I think, way to answer that question. But I think a lot of it is the pain of staying where they're at is so much greater. They'd rather, you know, borrow money, get an SBA loan, borrow money from family, friends, or cash in their 401k and launch out with their deli, their restaurant, their whatever. And so I think um, that... Um, there's that, there's opportunity, right? There's a lot of things. I think the reason, the bigger question though, I think is um, why don't they? Why don't people uh, t- take a chance? And they're, I believe it's because they're afraid to fail. They're, they're, they have fearful of failing. I'll give you an example. I remember being at Craig Proctor and I'm a huge fan of Craig Proctor, learned from him 20 years ago. And he said, he talked about charging six and 7%. And back then I only been in the business four years on your listings. I'm like, man, I'm struggling to get five and a half. And then they're like, well, Coldwell Banker will do it for five. Will you do it for four and a half? And it becomes a race to the bottom. And what Craig Proctor taught me 20 years ago, and it's a valid thing. And I'm sure Tom Ferry and Joe Stump and Mike Ferry and all the different trainers and of course Tim Harris I'm sorry the, the, the best of the best will teach you is in the absence of value it's all about price it's a race to the bottom if you're getting negotiated down on your listing fees in my opinion and, and I'm not a coach I'm just an agent is um, is because you're not demonstrating your value and then they're not seeing your value so then they're going to negotiate but when you've clearly displayed the value you bring to the table they will pay you handsomely. Like I could go to H&R Block and get my taxes done. I spend thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars a year getting my taxes done because I believe the CPA I hire is worth his weight in gold. We spend, I don't know, 72000 a year on our bookkeeper. I've had bookkeepers before. I don't normally pay bookkeeper, right? But our guy is so good. So I think that's a really important distinction. Last one I'll say is I remember when Tom Dave's the number one Keller Williams agent in the world seven times in the past 17 years. He said this one time. He said, look, when I go on a listing appointment and they're like, I don't want to sign. We want to pray about it. We're just, we're going to interview two or three more country, two or three more countries, two or three more companies agents and I was kind of walking out of there without signed listing agreements and he said this he goes here's what he would say to people he would say you know what let me just write on the listing agreement I'll just write it in right here that you may cancel for any reason at any time a 24-hour written notice I remember thinking heck no I'm never doing that I love those irrevocable listing contracts I don't want to get fired and it took me a while to, to have to be brave enough to overcome the fear to start writing that when people I only wrote it when people would hesitate I go yes you should pray about it but let's take five minutes to do the paperwork now if you wake up tomorrow and you decide it's a bad idea or you want to list just send me an email it's over it says it right here I finally got brave enough I overcame my fear of gee but my and I've never been fired on a listing for that <laughs> I've lost I've lost I've had three people say they want to go a different direction in the past 24 years about three times and it hurts as an agent after you put time and energy into one of them was a woman because I wouldn't pull weeds with her in her yard and you know, they have their reasons for wanting to go, go another direction but I think fear holds people back and I think pain moves them forward when they can't stand where they're at they're like I'm going to take a risk you just said something that's really important I hope the listeners were listening so everyone if you ask anyone whether they're more motivated by the carrot or the stick everyone says especially salespeople they always say I'm more motivated by the carrot but that's never true 
99.9% of everyone's more motivated by the fear of losing something they already have. So if you were to, I mean, just think about this. If, if you're trying to find out what's really going to motivate you, listeners, um, or if you're running a brokerage or a team or whatnot, it's losing something they already have. And it doesn't have to be monetary. It could be, well, the story is, uh, I think, uh, there's a coaching client I had. His name was Amone, his real name. What a name. I know. And he you had, and I have boring names compared I, to that. I know, right? So Monet had gotten to the point, this is before I started coaching him, where he was really, really overweight and like 400, 500 pounds or something. Oh, yeah. And as he, had been, this, he had this problem for a long time. And the doctor said, if you don't lose the weight, you're going to basically develop diabetes and you're going to have to have you know, blood circulation problems. You have to start losing fingers and feet and toes and all that. Um, he didn't take it seriously. So he goes to the doctor again, and uh, the doctor says, we need to schedule your surgery because I need to remove part of your foot. And it wasn't until that very moment that he decides to take seriously the uh, the fear of you know the, the fear of losing his foot actually got him motivated. And wow. as a result of that, but that's not even the good story. I the, think that would motivate a lot of us, though, right? Let me yeah, just but, take a but, hand. But this is what you were saying. You, so so it doesn't. What you were saying. Let me finish the Monet story. Okay. His name's Monet Castroneza Neves. If you're listening, I, I I tell your story frequently because it's such a good story. So he then loses all this weight, and he gets in such good shape, he's on the cover of a men's fitness magazine. No way. That's the story. That is awesome. Isn't that awesome? That's a happy ending. I well, love that. it even gets better. It, it, so I'm coaching him, and his goal was basically to live off passive income from paid-off rental properties, mm-hmm. and he actually got to that point, too. So not only did he get in great shape, but he also basically was able to essentially retire before he was like 45 or something. That's awesome. Isn't that? But that was fear of losing something they already have. Mm -hmm. So maybe the reason that more people like you listeners, the bottom line is, is you got to ask yourself if you're looking at EXP or if you're choosing not to look at EXP, maybe not worry about what your psychology is. I mean, he and I can talk about fear of loss or fear of gain. We can talk about scarcity versus abundance. We can talk about all these things until the cows come home, but maybe set that aside and just take a real good gander at it. And Brent's actually got a great video. I use it all the time. The model explain.com. Check out the video, see, you know, see if it works for you. If, if there's a shorter video too, you can text the word EXP to 31996 and then we'll text you back a video and you can watch it and it walks you through. Um, I mean, we can talk about EXP forever, but I personally think the human stories that have come from people's involvement in EXP is what really motivates me. And, and uh, Glenn, the founder of the company, said something. And this was one of the things that got Julie and I to really believe it and take it seriously. Now, he had said something similar to this, and then he'd restated it in a much clearer way. But the essence of it is, is agents never retire. And he needs to create a, full por- a foolproof system to make it so that they can retire and they can be free. Yeah. In essence, that's what he said. Oh, yeah. That, to me, is an incredibly, the, the most motivational thing. That, like I wish, as a coach, that I could guarantee somebody that. I can't. He can I love, right? the, I love the point you're making. Yeah. I've been 24 years in real estate. Um, I, I've been to birthday parties, anniversary parties, a lot of kind of party, graduation parties. I've never been to a real estate agent or broker retirement party, not once in 24 years. So it's it's pretty cool. And I was fortunate enough two years and 17, two years and seven months ago to retire from the listing of homes. I'd become a listing agent. Eventually you become a listing agent if you really figure out the name of the game and you have all your buyer's agents. And I had 18 agents on the Brent Cove team, 12 buyer specialists, six listing specialists, six listings I didn't want. But when you get to the point where your passive income goes over 100,000 a month and you're like, you know, I don't think I need to list homes anymore. Of course, my listing specialists loved it because now they got the million dollar listings and the right. two million dollar <laughs> listings and the, so they're loving it just take 50 percent we'll partner on them right but um my coach today is tim and julie harris they 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 just coach me not on real estate but on where to invest my money and i'm so grateful i'm sitting across the table from tim harris here at the ritz carlton in puerto rico and um, they're coaching us on what to do uh it's pretty awesome when you're in a point we start to earn millions of dollars a year and you're paying millions in taxes so there's some cool strategies we've come up with, and I'm very grateful, and I'm no, happy pleasure. to do the podcast as a big thank you. Yeah, well, I, I appreciate you appreciating it. Mm-hmm. And so as far as uh, the the key, I, I'm, I find this conversation interesting, and I, I'm wondering if you're going to go there with me. Okay. Okay, so at the heart of why, besides the fact that you love doing it, and you genuinely love helping people, and you're really, really freaking good at, at motivating people, you definitely have a skill for that. 
What's at the heart of why you're working in the first place other than those things? What is it that you're seeking? What's the, what's the, internal, the internal drive? I wonder what Kathy would say. We're, we're definitely not going there. No. <laughs> I don't know what Kathy would say, but, um, and we can ask her for sure. But um, for me, you know, I was very happy at Keller Williams. I mean, level 10, not like they didn't diss me. They didn't do any of those things. But one of the things I didn't have was freedom. I was a slave. I had, um, I had what most agents dream about. I had 18 to 28 listings on the books at all times that I handpicked, cherry picked. The hard clients that weren't coachable, I gave those to my six listing specialists. The listings that were an hour, two hours away, I gave. I, I had the listings that were geographically convenient for me to work. Nice, pleasant people that brought me gifts when we met. <laughs> you know that were coachable. I could say, "You need to drop the price a hundred grand on a high end listing," and they would do it. They wouldn't yell at me. You know, they, I knew the clients. You know, and so, but I didn't have freedom because what that means when you would when you reach nirvana in real estate, which for most agents is you're a listings agent and you have 18 to 28 listings and you're a baller in the community, here's what it means. I'm going to help you understand Nirvana and real estate. It means, because most people would love to do that, right? For at sure. all times. Here's what it means. You have 18 to 28 little bosses at all times. Yeah, for sure. Right? <laughs> the flyers are out of the flyer box. If they're married, it's more like 40. Right, right. In totally. the winter time, an agent tracked leaves and water into my white carpet, and I, no, I want totally to know. True. Or someone left the back door open, I'm going to sue that agent. I want to, I'm want i going to bring their brokerage down. All these crazy, they get really crazy. And, and mo- now, some of the, a lot of the sellers were great, but the ones who were crazy, who thought they were nice, and then their head does a full 360, it is October, right? They, they're like, oh my gosh, that person is possessed by the devil himself. Because when you touch their money, a lot of people, their money is everything to them. And so when you're, you know, there's the five big stresses, death, divorce, having a child, moving, right? You're in, in their finances, right? Job relocation, it's all money. People freak out. And so I do not miss those you get them throughout the year. We deal with it. That's we're tough. We deal with it, but I don't miss it. And I'm free. Two years, seven months, no listings. Now I build the company. I'm not retired. I still build EXP. I'm having the time of my life. But freedom, you hit on the head. I can do whatever we want to do now. Go anywhere, do anything. It's pretty cool. Hey, Kathy, could you give me a pen and paper? I'm having a 50-year-old moment where I'm losing my thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> it's my fault, totally. Yeah, well, but so that's... that. I, Dave Kennard said this, and we talked about this when we were at lunch, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, in life, most times, you lose your freedom when you increase your revenue, right? Right. So you have to, you have, if you want to make more money, you have to give up something else. Now, you can argue until you're blue in the face that if you hire out and you delegate out, but that's a fallacy. That's actually a nice, elegant lie. Oh, you, exactly. You, you build a team. You might not be working directly with your customers, but you're working with the remnants of your customers and you're working with your team. You're really just, you're, you're doing different things, but still taking a lot of your time. Yeah. I've never seen anything. And this is really, it's fascinating. Other than dividend paying, paying stocks. Thank you. Yeah. Other than dividend uh, paying stocks and maybe, you know, there's some other asset classes out there as well where you can actually increase your revenue at the same time you can increase your freedom. And that's the thing, and Dave Kennard pointed this out, and that's the thing that I think is really, truly uh, incredible, honestly. It's a gift from the real estate gods, as my wife would say. Absolutely. And, and that's something that people don't think. So you were saying something that's interesting. Do you think the reason that more people aren't, like, obviously tens of thousands of people are joining EXP, but we run into people occasionally which have a completely walled off mindset to it. They, maybe they've got the brokerage, maybe they have the franchise, maybe they have the team, they have their lot of ego and identity wrapped up in it. Do you think ultimately the reason is it's not just the fear of losing something they already have. And let's say that brokerage or that you know alliance to that particular brand is something that gives them a sense of being. But do you think it's also maybe because of they're not thinking that maybe they can handle the money? Do you think there might be something to do with the, the, the real, not the ability to visualize themselves making more or being more than what they already are i I would agree with that that they can't see it and then they hold themselves back you know you're your greatest asset and your biggest uh adversary you know you got to win inside dr dennis Swately back in the 80s said that series the inner winner you know if you're going to win outside you got to win inside first you got to vote for yourself you got to believe in yourself you had to be scrappy hard working all those things and i i think deep down um People can be positive or negative. They can walk into a room and brighten it up or bring 
thunderbolts with them and black clouds. When you walk into a room, do, are people glad to see you or do they duck for cover? Mm-hmm. You know, and in life, or do you see the possibilities or do you see all the, the limitations? And I think the way people see life holds them back. I saw the model and go, I could do that. That's what I saw. People see the model and be like, oh, I can't do that. It's a pyramid. Well, first small pyramids are illegal. And uh, it's not obviously not a multi-billion dollar pyramid international real estate company on the NASDAQ. Uh, that's not the case. So rule that one out. Well, it's some sort of network marketing scheme. A, network marketing companies are perfectly fine. They're wonderful. They're great. We're simply not that. We don't have um, you know weight loss products and vitamins and the different things there. We're not selling products, goods, and services like that. We're a real estate company. And you you do EXP at your company. Whether you'll admit it to yourself or not, you do it at your company because if you work at one of those brands I, I named, I've named a bunch of brands today, and you send someone to your company, most companies will give you a $10 Starbucks card from the sales manager. Hey, thanks for sending Susie. Thanks for sending Bob. We love them. Here's a little thank you note and a $10 Starbucks card. You might get lunch or dinner. Uh, maybe they send you to a steakhouse. Um, I remember at Remax, I got two cruises in 12 years their little three-day weekend Ensenada cruises they didn't even go because once you've been on the Ensenada little Mexico cruise for three days you're like "Ah, I'm good if I never go again so there's really no reward well EXP simply monetize that I don't care where you work people are gonna go how do you like it you're gonna go I hate it you're not gonna say that you wouldn't be there if you hate it that's great and then they go, hey, can I talk to your sales manager at XYZ Company? I'm like, sure, yeah, I'll put Bob in touch with you. I'll put Jenny in touch with you. They get in touch. They join that company. They start selling 30, 40, 50 homes a year or 20 homes a year. That brokerage gets paid 20, 30, 40, 50 times a year. You get nothing, my friend. And what is wrong with the company that says thank you? Glenn Sanford created exp like when agents sell homes and create revenue they share it back to the agents who referred them they say thank you like forever not the first year not the second year as long as they're with exp i have people that came to exp 10 years ago nine years ago eight years ago and whoever told me about it is still getting paid eight nine ten years later I referred over 100 agents to Remax in my 12 years, and I got three $10 Starbucks cards and two weekend cruises to Ensenada. They're like the Bahamas, little little $199 cruises, right? And that was it. And that was okay with me because I didn't know there was something better. EXP not only does that, they give you stock awards. And, and that's what I mean. I have friends who have hundreds of thousands of dollars in stock. They didn't even know it. They're like, they didn't even pay to. They're just selling real estate. Um, I have friends who now have over a million, lots of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, and they didn't get into the recruiting and all that. Like, well, I don't want to do that. And my company, they don't, so they don't pay you if you refer. No, they don't. I go, so your company, they just keep all the revenue. Yeah, they keep all the revenue. And you like that. Yeah, I like that. I mean, that's crazy. Listen to what you're saying right? And so there's nothing wrong that if you prefer a productive agent who's knocking down 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 deals a year, that you get paid for doing that on those sales. And then it adds up as time goes by. And I'm telling you what, we're going to take over the world because we're one of the only brokerages that is truly agent owned through the stock and then shares revenues back to those same agents. And every year we add more and more and more value. And I'm committed to adding value to eXp agents. And we are, we're growing like we're opening five countries this year and we just opened South Africa we're about to open France and Portugal and Mexico's right around the corner uh, India India I think India opens next week uh, Brazil I mean it's just crazy what's going on and you think what does that got to do with me it's got everything to do with you and if you're asking what does that got to do with you you don't understand the model Take the time to figure it out. You literally, it's like, well, I was never a part of Microsoft or Apple or Google. I get it. You are now, but you're passing on it because you're closed-minded and you think it's a pyramid or a network marketing scheme or something like that. And and you just don't understand it. So Do you take still run into that? People worried about the... It's Sometimes. Pretty, yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Rare. The ones who don't come. I mean, so many are coming. Yeah. I mean, I have 600 a plus a month net come into my organization that's like two massive offices every month that take 10 20 years to build every month yeah. i mean this is me not exp right it's crazy what's happening out there and there's 25 million agents by best standards 208 countries and we're in what nine well so you just said something really so in the united states there's supposedly over 2 million 2.3 million uh, licensed agents mm-hmm. 1.4 or whatever members of the national association of realtors 
So EXP only, and I mean only with quotes, has at the end of this year, let's say we have 42 or 43,000 agents, right? In the next year, let's say it's 100,000 agents. Think in terms of 100,000 versus just the United States, 2.3. And now you look at the globally, it's estimated there's 25 million agents. And then again, EXP at the end of next year, let's say it's 100,000 agents. That's a long way to grow. You yeah, know, that's a long way to go and a lot of growth. And that's yeah. the thing that people don't. And I, you know, I'll tell you something I've been hearing lately is I think I'm too late. What do you say to that? I think I'm too late. I think the train has already left the station with the XP. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, <laughs> yeah. That, that, I bet you people in 1850 thought they were too late to make money in California because the gold rush was in 1849 or, or 1855. I mean, you're never too late. That's why people come here from third world countries and become millionaires because they see the opportunity. You need to start seeing the opportunity. And there are people that will dig in and help you. I will help you. Tim Harris will help you. Sean Kokoska from Keller Williams, he used to be the president of MAPS Coaching, is here at EXP. He will help you. So many other people, big stars. And um, there's just a lot of help. And you're going to acquire stock. You're going to get revenue share if you do the work. Now, if yep. you don't do anything, you're not going to get those things. I'm not going to say it's going to be super easy. You're going to do nothing and make all this money. No. The difference is once you build this baby, you can back off because you back off. I don't care if you get 10 homes in escrow or 100. When you back off or the market corrects, your income is going to fall like a rock. And if you were around in 06, 07, 08, 09, 010, you know what I'm talking about. Maybe you went to work for the banks, but if you didn't figure that out and dial it in properly, the banks abused you as an agent, paid you as little as they could. Now, some of you figured it out, made a lot of money. You're, the, you're a very small percentage. Everyone else suffered, right? So you, you said two really good things there too. And one of the things that's very fascinating is the diversification of income. Everybody knows from an investment perspective, you have to have diversified stocks. Yeah. That way, if one sector, if tech goes to the crapper and you have pharmaceuticals, everything's going to balance out. Same goes with rental properties. You don't want all the rental properties in your own backyard in Sacramento, California. Right. And you're saying, you want to have them spread around in different markets because different markets during a corrective cycle have different, you know, North Carolina might be doing a heck of a lot better than Columbus, Ohio, which is doing better than Miami, those types of things. So that you guys get the idea of what I'm trying to convey to you. When you do revenue share with EXP, you have immediate built-in diversification because you're going to have agents, not just in your own market that you're sponsoring and you're part of sponsoring, but all over the United States and now globally. Because if you think about, okay, what would cause a global recession or even a United States recession or a housing crash or something like that? In your real estate business, if the market crashes and you're dependent on transactional income and that's your primary source of income, you will suffer. If you have a bunch of rental properties and they're not paid off and your rents go down, do you now have to cover the negative, you know, negative cash flow in those rentals? You will suffer. That's the thing that revenue share creates for you is it creates, it's essentially another stream of income that you can build while you're selling real estate. That's what people don't understand. And I wrote this down too, because I do hear this, right? I hear this probably 50% of the time. I don't want to sponsor agents or I don't want to recruit. So when you hear that, what do you tell them? It's like saying, I don't want to be a listing agent. Why a lot of you get in real estate, most people start off with buyers like, how do I get listing leads? How do I become a listing agent? And and I realize you wanted to become a listing agent, but you had to be like me saying, you're incapable of becoming a listing agent. Most people think that they can't do it. And the truth is, Henry Ford said it best, that old fashioned wisdom. He says, if you think you can, you probably can. And if you think you can't, you're probably right. And so you need to rethink your thinking. Why do you go to work? I go to work because I love my customers. Are you kidding me? I love my customers too, but I go to work for my family. I hope you go to work for your family while I'm single. Well, I don't know why you go to work then, but the rest of us, most of us go to work for our families or, and, or you raise money for causes you care about. But so here's the bottom line is I, it drives me crazy. What does the EXP do for the customer? You know what? I've heard that for 25 years. You've got to... You know what? You know when I left Remax and went to Keller Williams, you know what Keller Williams did for my customers? Nothing. It's what I did for my customers when I brought 37 listings and escrows from Remax to Keller Williams. Keller didn't do boo for my clients, even though I think they're a great company and loved them. You know what Remax did for my clients at Remax in 12 years? So I became the number one in, in transaction count in California, which is a great state to be the top dog in number of sales and number 11 worldwide in volume. And, and all that, uh, you know what Remax did for my customers? Nothing. It was a logo. It was me, man. It is you. I don't know what your. I guess some companies do some marketing. I never saw it at Remax, man. Never saw it. 
So I never saw it at Keller Williams. They give you some stuff, but it was what you do for your clients at whatever company you're at. And when you go to EXP, so stop asking, what is EXP? You know what? They're going to get the same great service you currently give. Well, my service is terrible. Well, then you ought to work on your service. But it's, it's what EXP is going to do for your family and your family, my kids and my kids, my grandchildren. I'm telling you, Coldwell Bankers was 100 years ago, and their grandchildren's grandchildren are benefiting today because they built a company. And most of you just sell like chickens at Foster Farm laying eggs on a conveyor belt. And, and no, I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. I don't care if you have seven escrows or 21 escrows or 121 escrows a month. You are laying eggs, baby. You are just pumping out. You're like a dairy cow at a dairy farm. Quit getting milked. I'm not even joking. Build oh, farm something. analogies. Build I can't a salesperson. No. I'm the one Build from Ohio. A sales. You're the one good. from Sacramento. Uh, yeah, I've never. I should have the farm analogies. Yeah. You're taking all the good ones. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Okay, keep going. I'll well, you. so you're actually touching on, again, another great point, obviously. Uh, and this is a conversation I had yesterday or the day before with somebody. It was a brokerage or a team. And he said, I noticed that eXp doesn't do, these weren't his words, I'm just summarizing, a lot of consumer-facing branding and marketing and advertising with, that some of the other brands do. And I said, do you see how that's a benefit to you? And he goes, well, kind of, sort of. I said, because eXp is not trying to dominate your local brand. It's, you know, it'd be Brent Gove, uh, you know, real estate team or whatever, brokered by eXp. And, and that's something that people, that is right there, I think, such an incredibly powerful differentiator is they want you to be the consumer facing brand. They don't want to dominate your brand or tell you how to make yourself. That right that is something that's truly special. It is fascinating to me because other franchises in particular, if you they're so particular about how all of your marketing and your signage looks, and if you become more dominant in any way, you're just gonna start getting pushback from the franchisor and the holder and the of the region and all that, because you're working for this company, whereas EXP you know, it's a difference between the old question is, is um, you know, what are you paying your broker? And the new question is, is what, are your, what is your broker paying you? That's the essence of it and, and, and who the brand is. And that's something that's really, that people need to remember um, because that keeps you, clo- that gets you closer to freedom and not farther away. If you have to compete with your local brand for brand recognition or they're telling you how your marketing and advertising is, trying to look, is, is supposed to look, obviously they're doing it for the betterment of themselves, not the betterment of you. And that's another little bit of genius of many amazing things that Glenn thought of when he was putting this idea together. You know? And I like what you said also about the fact that every um, brokerage right now does have revenue sharing or profit sharing. They're just not sharing it with the agents, right? I mean, if you think about it, there's an agent, and then there's the office manager, and then there's the office, the, whoever owns the franchise, let's say, and whoever owns the region, and whoever's above that, all the way up to the corporate guys. All those people, when you do a transaction, you are involuntarily participating in revenue share. Yeah, exactly, but you're just not getting any of it. It's going to the right. bosses, it's not going to you. And can you describe the difference between revenue share and profit share? This is something, again, I hear people using those interchangeably, and they literally could not be any yeah. different. Yeah, we copied Keller Williams' seven-generation profit share system, and profit is what's left over after all your expenses. Revenue's the big number. Profit is a little number, if there is any. So when you get half of, of, of the profit, and there could be none or very little, little revenue share is a mathematical number we can calculate, and it's a big number. I remember my first revenue share check for 10 days was $1,900. That's pretty good. My first 30 days, it was $5,000, $60,000 a year. That's pretty good. The next month, my second 30 days at eXp, two and a half months in, it was $10,000 a month, $120,000 a year. That's pretty good. So revenue share is amazing. But I want to tell you this. Um, Two things. Number one, everybody's just working, 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 going to retire someday, go live here someday, do this. There was a couple. I got a call last night, right, honey? Remember that call last night? He called me honey again. This is so weird. Yeah, yeah. Talking to my wife, (laughs) Kathy. Her nickname is Pebbles. So she's over there. So Kathy's over there. So um, that's our affectionate name for her. Okay, she's Pebbles. What are you? (laughs) I don't know. Do I have a name? I'm Fred. I'm Fred. If I was, they asked me, I did someone interview me, some magazine. They go, if you were a movie star, who would you be? I thought about it. I go, Fred Flintstone. <laughs> I'm Fred Flam. Oh, that's me. I'm barefoot right now, by the way. Okay, so here's the deal. Here's the deal. Um, got a call last night, and a sweet couple, not going to say their names. Everybody loved them, and Keller Williams talked them out of EXP. They stayed at Keller Williams, and they're, they're respected, probably 30 years in the industry. Everybody loves this couple, and they didn't come. And plus, trust me, when I left Remax, they told me Keller Williams would destroy my career. 
I prospered and did well and personally loved Remax, but I liked Keller Williams even better. And so, A, it didn't destroy my career, but they're losing their their one of their star players to the competing team, right? Same thing, when I left Keller Williams, they said EXP would destroy my career. And I, I went ahead and went there in my mind, okay, six months from now, I hate it. It doesn't work. How much have I invested? 149 bucks. Okay, capital risk, nothing. The application fee is $149. To become an EXP agent. Yeah. And I go, and I don't like it. I just switch back to Keller Williams. And I told him that. I go, look, if, you, if you're right, I will be back in six months. Six months later, my revenue share was like 28000 a month every month. After 13 months, it was 55000 a month. And then four months later, after 17 months, it's over 100000 a month. I was shocked. Maybe you're shocked, and it's 1.2 million a year, and it's way, 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 way more than that. We pay double that in taxes, and so um, it, it is unbelievable. But I didn't listen to people who cared about me and were sincere. I weighed the risk. I calculated the risk. It was my ego. It was not a capital risk. It was me taking my hat, my cap, into my hand, walking back to Keller Williams and go, "You were right. I was wrong." And I go, "What's the word? they're going to have a big belly laugh? Ha ha ha! You're so naive. You're so gullible, Gove. You're so you get suckered into that exp thing." And and I went there. And go, Is that it? Is that the worst that can happen? They have a good laugh, and then they take me back at 100 percent for a year because I might be going to Remax and give me a free office. I go. It doesn't sound so bad. I'm going to try EXP, and worst case, I go back. I'm just a guy who's okay with failure, and that's why I've succeeded wildly. It's because I'm willing to try stuff, and everyone plays it safe, plays it safe, save face, protect the precious ego. And so um, I tell you what, it worked. And so this couple, back to this couple, I got a call last night. They knew she wasn't feeling well, and as what I heard from another fellow agent at Keller Williams, and they go, we need to retire. And they retired, they sold their home, they bought one, I think, in North Carolina. I think that's where they actually bought their home. I know you just bought a home in North Carolina. And she passed away last night before oh, they even God. got out of town. Worked their whole life and then died. And it's super tragic. I'm not going to say their Sad. names. But, uh, it, you know, and, and we're praying for them and the husband. And, and it's like, now what? Chapter two, he's alone. Don't work your whole life. Do not listen to people who think they, they're so in bed with the brokerage. They own franchises. Maybe they own parts of the region. They are not going to let themselves see this opportunity. Like there were people who owned 20 or 30 blockbuster franchises. They wouldn't let themselves see the power of Netflix. The CEO of Blockbuster goes, no, this will never fly. People love getting hot tamales and popcorn and all the junk they buy before they check out. It's a joke. Don't worry about Netflix. Well, how'd that turn out? There were travel agents that said people will never order their cruises online. They like to come in and get our brochures, which I used to love go get brochures. from. If you're in a bad mood, go to a travel agent and get some brochures of Paris or Tahiti. It'll put you in a good mood. Guess what? How many of you go to your travel agent to get uh, airfare, hotel, a rental car, a cruise? None of us do. Life is changing. And so um, that's what I think. People just get so close, so tunnel visioned. Um, <laughs> we never had this. It's so funny. We're recording this in my beautiful suite, and we've had the people. No one ever knocks on the door. It's Grand Central Three Station here. Three people have knocked on the door today. It's crazy. <laughs> Anyways, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, so Julie and I, last week, we did a, a three podcasts in a row, and it was basically the phases of mastery, which I know you're familiar with. It goes, Julie, I wish she was here. She's got all these memorized. It goes unconscious incompetence, conscious incompetence. And th that's what you're describing, and there's two levels, uh, three levels really above that. So the first level is where you're basically ignorant and you don't know it. It's like when you get into real estate, you get your license, you don't know what you don't know, and that's when you're most susceptible to basically taking really, you know, heinous advice from people that are not having your best interest in mind. Then you have, let's use your listing example, right? So you don't know what you don't know. You have your butt handed to you a few times in a listing appointment. You realize that you're not, you know, you're not competitive. You move past your own excuses as to why you failed to take that listing, right? The normal agents will say, well, they overpriced it or somehow they had a social connection. You didn't take the listing because the seller thought the other person was better than you. You lost in competition. It's really that simple. And then you move to when you allow yourself to suffer that loss, which you have to experience and suffer the losses fast so that you don't have to drag it out for decades. Yes. Then you, right? I always say, say when people get are- trying, it over Get with. it over with. Like, you know, so experience as much hardship as fast as you can and realize you didn't die and do it as quick as you can. Well, then this phase after that is conscious incompetence. And that's where you realize that you are, you know, you're aware that you're not good at certain things and maybe a lot of things. 
And what you're describing is your willingness to put yourself in a position of being, con- uh, of essentially feeling ignorant again, feeling dumb. You put yourself back in a position of a new agent, you know, almost four years ago. You put yourself back in a position where you had to become a recruiter, where you had to learn about EXP. You had to learn how to work in you know, all the things you had to learn to basically get to where you are today. That right there is innate in you and it goes to your unwillingness to basically stay complacent whereas what most people do and i'm summarizing my own tim brain what you said is they want to put themselves in a golden cage where everything's predictable and everything's the same they never want it to change and they don't want anything outside of that even if it's for their own betterment to to inflict any kind of anything that would make them uncomfortable and and then decades go by and you don't retire in real estate. And that's what's kind of scary and sad at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. So, so your willingness to make yourself uncomfortable, and that, that's something I've ex- frankly experienced. Mine, that was an issue I went through, truthfully. And when I got involved in eXp, I said, I want to see if I still have my sales chutzpah. And, and it, I sponsored over 40 people my first month. You know, I, wow. went, I wanted to see if I could do it. It took me eight months to do that. Yeah. Well, I wanted to see if I could still do it, right? Yeah. And, and, and that was something that was a personal challenge. You could say even it was an ego challenge. But I also, the reason is, is because, you know, we wanted to build a really big group inside EXP. And I want everyone that came after us to know that we weren't just blah, 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 that we actually were forward deployed, locked in and able to do the actual work. And I think, yeah. you know, that's what people want. But I really wanted to show them that I wasn't complacent. Beautiful. Even, even though financially we could easily be, that we weren't. And that's what I think. Yeah, I know your story. He's yeah. not kidding there. And that's the reason I think of, uh, ultimately that's what's exciting about EXP. Because if you're ready for a rebirth, right, we all have to go through rebirths. Usually it's involuntarily. Yeah. But if, we, if, you know, if you're ready for a rebirth at whatever age, uh, you really got to look at EXP because it's going to give you what you've ultimately always sought, which is freedom. I mean, that's the reason pe- people don't originally get into business for freedom. They get into business because they, you know, want to have. Uh, they don't have a boss, or they, you know, want to pay for a trip to Disney World or buy a couch. But after a while, you realize that really what your heart wants and your soul wants is a sense of freedom where you no longer have to worry about money. It's very, very difficult to do that in real estate, especially when selling real estate does not make you rich. It's what you do with the profits from selling real estate. And the, most, the reason that most brokers and agents ever become rich is because they don't have enough profits to be, reinvest that money. That is the bottom line. Uh, but once you realize what uh, Glenn has done at EXP by creating multiple streams of income, we've been talking forever about revenue share. You know, there's some people out there, I don't want to hear about revenue share, fine. You know, so if someone joins Brent Gove's uh, organization, and they don't want to talk about revenue share, I'm sure Brent and Kathy will happily unburden them and take the revenue share for them. They can just reroute Absolutely. the wiry. Well, You'll me, do that. Let me, let me, you hit on something <laughs> That's earlier. That's a joke. I know, I know, I know. Let me hit on something earlier. He said, well, some, a lot of people say, well, I don't want to recruit. I don't want to recruit. Um, here's what recruiting is. I went up against uh, on a listing appointment. I didn't ask enough questions. Didn't, I didn't get the listing, and I was shocked because I usually get the listing. And this, this happened like eight years ago. By this point, I would go on a listing and pretty much get the listing, and I didn't get it. And I'm like, hmm. I got a little – I just didn't ask. By the way, are you interviewing anyone else? It turned out they go like – I said, hey, just so I could learn, you know, what did the other agent do that I didn't do? Because this is how I provide for my family. Obviously, you had more faith in them. Can you just tell me so I could learn, so I could do a better job in the future? They go, yeah, we will. We actually interviewed five different agents in five different companies because they were doing their homework. But the agent we went with, I go, if it makes you feel better, Brent, you are our number two pick. (laughs) It's like your wife saying, you are my second choice to marry. Well, that's no good if your dream girl married some other dude. Okay, so I'm like, I go, what was it he did? They go, honestly... You were very good, but he just wanted it worse. He was so excited. He goes, you give me this listing, I will, I will, you say jump three feet, I'll jump five. He goes, I'm so excited to have this listing. You just give me a chance. I will outwork, out hustle. I'm the guy, nobody will work harder to sell your listing than me. You give me a chance. Man, the Cobalt Banker people came in a suit and tie with their briefcase and their laptop. And, and then the, the Century 20 agent had this really fancy CMA and, and you came, you didn't have much of anything but you were you were convincing but he he was like next level the reason we chose him is we just believed that he really would work harder and hustle and do more and fight harder to represent us and we listed with him so guess what next listing appointment i went on 
Give me this listing. I'll give my right arm to have this listing. You say jump five feet, I'll jump six. I, I will outwork, out hustle, do anything. Well, that's not my personality. Fine. Enjoy listing two homes a year or a month or whatever. Well, so you said something. That's awesome. Right? I copied him. I flat yeah, copied him and got like the next 30 listings in a row, which I know I got listings I wouldn't have gotten, but go ahead. Oh, we're going to start talking real estate stuff. My brain's going to go into coaching. Oh, mode, yeah. And it's it hard for awesome. me to come out of that. Oh, go ahead. Do but, it. Well, so, I mean, you just said it, right? If you, you don't, if you have energy and enthusiasm, naturally you're blessed. Okay. Mm -hmm. For sure. Not everybody does, but you can also learn to show that you have energy and enthusiasm. You can show emotion and you can learn to essentially appeal to sellers that are looking for that energy and enthusiasm. Because ultimately, guys... One of the key differentiators between somebody that's successful in any facet of life is their ability to make somebody feel a certain way. That's one of Brent's superpowers, right? When you talk to Brent, go over, you listen to him present, he makes you feel a certain way. That, if you think about actors, doctors, you think about anybody successful in life, it's because they make you feel a certain way. Maybe it's confidence, maybe it's uh, aspirational, maybe it's whatever it is. You're make, and when you were talking in that listing appointment, you are making them feel excited. You are making them feel motivated. You are making them feel, and it's like, why is it that you know Tom Cruise gets paid you know forty million dollars per movie, and if I were to make a movie, they give me four dollars. Right. Because, it's because Tom Cruise makes them feel a certain way, right? It's that emotional connection to people that if you don't have skills, develop that emotional connection, and no better proof, frankly, uh, and I think this is true, than my wife and I. Our first year in the business, we sold 104 houses, and we sure as hell didn't know what we were doing. Wow. Yeah. Well, I mean, You're excited, up. though. You're just doing totally. it. Totally. Well, it's yeah. energy and enthusiasm, right? Yeah. So it, energy and enthusiasm is the first number one thing, and I think I know why you looped into that, because you're saying even if you don't know how to recruit or sponsor agents, Correct. it's your energy and enthusiasm that will actually bring them into the end zone. You, wrap, you put a bow on it. That's it. So here's the deal. It's, it, quit saying, I don't want to recruit anyone. If you ever go to an Italian food restaurant or the steak and seafood restaurant, or we just went to this place on the beach here in Puerto Rico overlooking the Caribbean, and we had lobster. You pick it out, two and a half pounds. They grill it on the grill, and it's they put it in garlic and butter. It was amazing. It was like the best experience I've ever had in my life. That's recruiting. It's when you can be excited about, so excited about Keller Williams or Cobalt Banker or Berkshire Hathaway or EXP. I think, well, why would I do that at Berkshire Hathaway or Remax or Sotheby's? I agree. You're really not getting paid to do that. But at EXP, and I did it anyways because I love those companies, but at EXP, I started getting paid like crazy. So you're, don't think of the word recruiting. Just be excited about what you're doing when people ask you about it. And guess what? People think, well, all you did was recruit, Brent? Are you kidding? I went on listing appointments every day, sometimes two a day. All I did was go on dumb listing appointments, which was my, all I wanted to do was to go on, you know, list and get a bunch of ton of listings. And then, uh, you know, you achieve that and you realize you have 18 to 28 little bosses at all times. And that could be fun and it could not be fun, usually not fun. But here's the deal. Once I figured it out, it was game over. And so same thing. Just be excited. You'll sponsor people. But I want to I give you one success principle. Most people say open houses. Oh my gosh, I was out there from one to four. I broke a heel. I Someone honked their horn at me. They ran over my sign. It's some teenagers steal my open house signs. Oh, I was out there from noon to four. It was exhausting. I would get out there at open houses at 10 and work till six. And sometimes if I had bills to pay, I'd get out there at nine and work till nine at night and put in a 12 hour. Well, that seems a bit extreme. Well, I don't know if you got bills to pay, get off your and go do something and go fight for your family. You need to, I would do it Saturday and Sunday, nine to nine Saturday, nine to nine Sunday. I worked hard on the weekends. I was a weekend warrior, but guess what? I got really good at converting people to open houses. I got so good that I would actually, I remember this one open house I did in a rain, blinding rainstorm. I had to bungee cord the signs to trees and poles because they would blow away. And I had to bring a change of clothes and a towel because I got soaking wet. I had 37 guests come through the door in three and a half hours. I convinced um, them, every one of them, to give me their social security numbers. Now, how many agents get social security numbers at open houses? I did. I Out of those 37 people who said, yeah, here, run my credit. I'm like, well, what'd you say? That's a whole nother podcast. But the point is this. I did so many. I learned what to say. Nobody taught me how to do it. I learned how to do it because I did so much of it. You're, you're saying something I think that you, 
this is such a critical point. You were telling, you're saying that you did not wait to get into action until you'd mastered something. You got into action, learned along the way. Progress before perfection. Yeah, but that right there, I mean, in the coaching realm, that right there is the whole ball. It's of wax. Money. It's money. Well, for sure. But spot the, on. But I most, don't mean money. I mean it's spot on. But most people, if I look at all of our tens of thousands of coaching clients we've had forever, right? And mm-hmm. I look at what, which ones are like when I talk to somebody, I, you get this innate. You get it too. I'm sure you get this innate sort of intuitive feel. Sometimes you're wrong, but usually you're right. Mm -hmm. And the difference between the person that's really going to do something and the person that's not is the person that's not is going to spend years getting ready to get started. And and the couple you were talking about, I don't know who they are and I don't want to know who they are. But I bet you in a lot of their ways, they perfected real estate. They got really good at that. And they just stopped trying. They, they just wanted to stay in their golden cage. And maybe they got to the point where, you know, it was just as, as you know, comfortable as it needed to be. And they yeah. weren't willing to make themselves uncomfortable. Yeah. And then essentially, literally, life goes away. You just, you don't have yep. enough time. To, and maybe you, you know, that's the unfortunate it's truth, sad. guys. But it's sad. It yeah, breaks worked my Worked their whole life till they died. Now, some people get to live Five, 10, 15 years past that or 20, but yeah, still, what'd you really do with your life? See, these Don't the, you want to be a history maker? Don't you want to do something great with your life? These are the, it it come, does not come without risk. These are the depressing thoughts you have when you're in your fifties, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, I got none. I, I've tried so many things. I've failed at so much more than I've succeeded at, but because I'm willing to fail, I've succeeded greatly. And I will tell you this of those 37 people, 19 of them got approved. I picked up 19 approved buyers the next day. I didn't pay a dime from them, no pay-per-click. Mm-hmm. I'd met everyone, shook their hands, looked them in the eye, and I called them back and said, congratulations, Tim Harris. You're approved to buy a home for $400,000. let us go shopping. I did it 19 times the next day. That is how you start setting goals to sell 30 homes in 30 days, not 30 homes in a year. Are you kidding me? Quit playing life so small. You playing at such a small level does not serve humanity. There are lives you could change. We have an Excel spreadsheet of the charities we give to because we can't keep track of it. And we care about a lot of things and we give and give and give and, 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 you know, it's crazy to give. I mean, we're talking big numbers because we've been playing big. We take it. We don't necessarily risk money, although that's a part of it for sure. But risk your ego. Your ego is keeping you broke and be willing to go out there and try to fail. Worst thing, someone has a good laugh and you go back. What's the harm in that? And I tell you what, Tim and I will fight for you. There's so many people that will help you. And I'm just, I'm too fired up, but. I, I became great at open houses because I, I did so much. And then I got a point where I didn't have to do them anymore. Short-term pain, long-term gain. Well, so you're looping into two things I wrote down. But you just – actually, Jerry Seinfeld, I just was listening to him yesterday in a podcast. He said something really funny. He said, if you want to improve – now, he's a comedian, right? So he said, if you want to improve – this is his advice. I never heard of him. His, <laughs> yeah, right, right? his advice to other comedians. He said, if you want to make the world better, write better jokes. You know, I mean, if you think about what he's trying to say, he's saying stay myopic. And if you are a real estate professional, if you're, you know, whatever it is you're doing, just get really, really good at what you're doing. I thought that was a kind of an interesting tie in. Absolutely. Yeah. And so here's an interesting thing about, I think, um, the whole motivation thing, because I think people will say you're a motivated guy. You're, you know, da, 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 da. those are qualities and characteristics that I think are part of the Brent and Gove USP. Agreed? Sure. Yeah. Okay, so were you always like that, or did you have to develop that, or did you just basically have to? And I'll ask Kathy because she'll probably give me a, a clearer answer. But how? Did, where is that? I was so bad at open houses when I started that I wrote them off for years. I was so bad at listings and didn't like working with sellers that I wrote them off for years. People would call me and say, hey, would you come list my home? I'd say, you're in the pocket, right? It's particular in Sacramento. Yeah, I go, Century 21 is real active out there. I wouldn't even take the time to refer them. I go, call Century 21. They'll list your home. So I, I was not, I was, when I started in sales at 19, I used to shake. People used to put their hand on my shoulder and say, it's okay. It's okay. I'm going to listen to you. What do you got to say? Just take a breath. It's okay. So I almost said a bad word. I powered through it. I freaking powered through it. I don't know why, but I did. And no, I was not like this. I learned to be, and I don't know if this is a good thing, but it's just the way I am today. And and I'm loving people. I'm making a difference. And money is a byproduct of playing your life big. And, and it just comes. The more value you add, you are paid in direct proportion the amount of value you bring the market. And if some of you don't like what you're getting paid, you, my friend, 
are not bringing enough value. So rethink what you're doing and get over it. If you're a door knocker, quit door knocking. I do two hours a day. Start doing it for eight, 10 hours a day. Get good fast. Get it over with. You can't golf once a month and get good at golf. You can't get, shoot three throws once a month and get good at free throws. Dude, get it again get it again. And a lot of it, you get good. Get a coach. Hire a coach. I don't care what you're doing. And get on with it. You can do great, amazing things in your life. But if you listen to your friends, you can't do nothing. If you listen to your relatives, you need to get a job. You know What books are you re- reading? I'm, ta- I'm preaching to the choir. You guys are listening to the Tim and Julie Harris podcast, the most successful real estate podcast in America. I'm preaching to the choir. Good for you. But go to the next step. Go to a Tony Robbins event. Go to a Grant Cardone event. Go to a Francis Chan or Lance Wall now or a John Maxwell event and go and learn and, and pay for coaching. I remember at Craig Proctor 21 years ago, sat by a guy, I was three years in the business, and the guy crossed his arms, his legs, and his eyes. He goes, I'm not doing this. This guy just wants my money. He just wants me to sign up for coaching. And he didn't sign up for coaching. I, went, I go, I don't know. It seems pretty good. I'm going to give it a shot. I went and signed for, up for coaching. Five years later, I went from selling 40 homes a year to over 400 because I'm a sucker willing to try things. I was willing to pay for coaching. I put Not every coaching program worked. I'm not saying it's going to work. Not everything I, I tried TV, I flopped. But I was trying this, trying that, trying this, trying that. I found out what worked. And that's my message to you. Try more than you're trying. Hustle. Do more. Outwork your competition. And, and have balance. I've taken my wife out every Wednesday and Saturday night for like 29 years we've been married. I've, I've coached soccer in Little League. I have balance. When you work, work. And when it's time to play, play. Don't mix the two. So the word balance is kind of BS though, is it not? Because how can you ever have balance when you're actually, when your kids were younger and you were having to work more? And well, I mean, you, all- you work all day, you come home and work well, all night. But just, I, I think you should just decide when you're going to work and when you're not going to work. Oh, I for did. sure. That's what you meant. That's but what I mean. The, there's a lot of people that make themselves mentally unstable, basically, <laughs> because they're trying to l- literally have a proportional amount of everything. You right. Know, this is for this. This is for this. You can't really do I'll it. I'll give you an example. I've golfed every Friday for two decades. Every Friday morning for 20 years. I don't miss. I go in the rain. I go in the sun. I go when it's hot. I go when it's cold. I go when it's perfect in the spring and the fall. I don't miss. That's balance. It's like people say, come listen to my $5 million ranch. Uh, I have a commitment. I'm free at two. Because you know what I do? I'm going to go chase a little white ball around. Because mm. I have priorities. I have balance. I have priorities. Same thing. Saturday night, I'm taking my wife to dinner in the movies. Taco Bell in the movies. If you're, guess what? I'm not going to go take that listing appointment. Right. Sure. I understand. That's but, what I mean. But if you are, if, be realistic here, listeners. If you're in a point in your life where you have to earn money and you don't, you're basically facing down a financial future that's not that, you know, it's bleak, you better be willing to be you know, in out of balance to focus on your finances and at different points in your life, you're going to be focused on different things. And as you become more financially well off, then you can actually start focusing on maybe all five categories of life. Right? So people talk about balance and I don't want you to be confused by what he's saying. Cause he said it uh, twice is that don't be one of these people that makes yourself feel like you're less than other people who claim to have some sort of perfect harmony of life. It doesn't really exist at different phases or seasons in your life. You're focused on different things. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's really the bottom line. And if you, if you need to buy groceries, go work 18 hours a day. If that's you're in right. Jeopardy of losing your being kicked out of your rental property or your home and foreclosure. Go work 18 hours a day. Suck it up. Put up your big boy pants, your big girl pants and go do what mama needs to do. What daddy needs to do. Go kill something, drag it home to the family and feed them. Do what it takes. <laughs> that's right. I'm, I'm like way too mellow here. I'm, I'm like totally like candy coat. Well, I'm trying to show the world a different side of you, sir. Ooh, it's my third cup of coffee. I know. It's kicking in. <laughs> We're championing it. I hate to think what each of these cups of coffee are costing here at the Ritz Carlton. Yeah. Um, but you're paying for this is your room, so yep, I'm okay. Yep. <laughs> so you, here's another thing that you said, which is actually I think it's chapter four in our book, is you in essence said do what you don't want. To, if you want long-term le- uh, ever-increasing levels of success in your life, learn to master the art of doing what you don't want to do when you don't want to do it at the highest level. Absolutely. And sometimes it takes external pressures of uh, you know financial hardship to get you to do that. But the there's a huge mental chasm that a lot of people wrestle with needlessly where they feel like they could only be successful when they feel a certain way. They can only do what they don't want to do when they feel passion. They, I remember prospecting, even hell, I do things nowadays even that I don't want to do when I don't want to do them and I have to do them at the highest level. I mean, I don't always feel like doing coaching calls. 
sometimes it feels I'm asking myself, why the hell am I doing it? You know, but I know once I'm doing the coaching call, that feeling set aside and I'm focused on that coaching client and I'm trying to deliver the most value I can for them to help them. And the same thing goes with every aspect of your life. It's not always about, and I'm not going to even ask Brent this question because I'm fearful of his answer, but the truth is, is that the, your six, financial success rarely follows doing what you're passionate about. That is another one of the great elegant lies of the 21st century. Be passionate about what comes from the results of doing whatever it is that you're doing to provide service to other people. Don't conflate those two. You don't have to be passionate about selling real estate to be incredibly successful at selling real estate. Matter of fact, if you start out being passionate about selling real estate, it doesn't take too long to get kicked in the head too many times before all of a sudden your passions have waned. So develop passions for what you do with the profit that comes from selling real estate. Very good, very good. I love it. And some of you out there, you're like, I don't know if I could be like Tim Harris. I don't know if I could be like... You're missing the point. Be like you. You don't have to be like Tim or me. Be you. Be authentically you. People love authenticity. And let me tell you why. You can make it and you can be successful to whatever degree you want to be. It's called this. Tim, have you ever heard this saying? It's trite or whatever, but do you know what the biggest room in the world is? The biggest is at the Taj Mahal, the Reagan Library. What's the, the Carnegie Hall? What's the biggest room in the world? Have you ever heard this one? Mm, probably. It's a mindset question. So I think think you're going to say something like your mind or something you know good. He, he's close semi-spiritual he's close. so here it is here it is the biggest room in the world and it's so true is the room for improvement <laughs> i love that one. Isn't that true i mean who of you raise your hand if you are stuck being you you're just like yeah i can't get any better i'm the world's greatest dad i'm the i'm the world's greatest salesman like Og mandino no my friend you can improve you can have a different future you could go i don't care anymore i don't care who tells me no on door knocking i don't care who tells me no when i call the expires you're gonna do it and do it and do it you're gonna do massive action create amazing results you're gonna have a great life and so man you got to get down to this man most people are living to die you got to be dying to live martin luther king said i have a dream Kennedy said, you know, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you could do for your country. Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, Abraham Lincoln, putting an end, the Emancipation Proclamation. Do something great with your life, man. Don't live a life of quiet desperation. Come on, rip your shirt off and scream. Do something great. Now, I know I'm kind of fired up on caffeine here, but I mean every word of this. And just get it over with. If you suck, then start sucking some more and get it done. And you'll suck a little bit less, a little less prison. You're, you're not too bad. And the more you do, all of a sudden, you are you're great. People will call you crazy. Then they will call you for advice. There was a time nobody would call you for financial advice in your life, right? You grew up in Columbus, Ohio. You didn't have much, right, Tim? Sure, definitely. I, my wife and I looked to Tim for advice on where to invest, and we had to invest hundreds of thousands of dollars a month. And Tim's our coach, and we have other wealth advisors too, but we believe, we trust him. They will call you crazy, and then they'll call you for advice. But you, my friend, have to pay the price. And that's doing it and doing it and doing it to you get good, scheduling that family time. Do not at the expense of your family. Don't do that. Yeah, definitely. And if you're younger and you're broke and you have a young family and you know you have to basically maybe sacrifice a little bit of family time, here's a little coaching tip. Go to them, assuming your kids are old enough, and say, you know, mommy or daddy has to basically be working a long extra hours to accomplish specific financial goals. And after daddy or mommy, whoever the agent is, you know, has done this many transactions and create a little thermometer and put it on your wall. And every time you do a deal, you know, the family gets to color in. It's like the old Jerry Lewis telethon, right? Yeah. And then once the, te- once the uh, thermometer is all awesome. colored in, at the top right, Disney World. So if you want to know motivation, I'll tell you what it is. Having a bunch of little rugrats riding your ass as to why you didn't have a, you haven't colored in your thermometer in a while. Ooh. But that's a way to tie in your family goals. And you can just, that's the type. they of, want to go to the Grand Canyon or, or they want to go to Disney World or exactly. SeaWorld. I love it. That's yeah. beautiful. I, yeah. And so in people oftentimes, there's a great book called Profits Aren't Everything. They're the only thing. But what people will often do, men more than women, truthfully, is they'll use I have to volunteer here, or I have to do this thing, or I have to use that thing as an excuse not to do what they don't really, what they should be doing, which is taking care of women as well. But I'm just saying men, women very rarely, I found, are often as good, if not better, at coaching clients and, than men because they're rarely confused about 
the fact that they have to provide for you know they're more they're more tied to finances it seems than a lot of men are men are mostly men are driven by different things than women are it's the easiest way for me to say it generally speaking not trying to be politically incorrect here just generally speaking some hopeful uh, universal truths here and so when you're when you're talking to a when I'm coaching somebody and running into a guy and he says well you know what Tim I would have done that I would have you know made those calls I would have done what I didn't want to do when I didn't want to do at the high school but I had to volunteer volunteer more at the you know whatever or I had to do more of this more of the other thing so you're rationalizing um, you know spending time doing the things that you want to do uh, as an excuse not to do the things you're supposed to do. And it's what Brent said earlier, your job, number one, is to take care of your family. Take care of, meet the obligations and the commitments that you've made. And if that means that you never do a church activity or never play softball or t-ball because you're too busy focused on earning financial security for your family, that's what you're supposed to do. What do you think about that? I agree. It's called man up, woman up, yeah, do but the people, right thing. People don't do that. They rationalize nowadays being lazy. And I see that happening all the time. Real estate <laughs> agents are the classic, right? I have to have balance. So I'm not going to pick up the phone. I'm not going to actually do what makes me uncomfortable because I have to go and, you know, coach Sally in soccer. Well, trust me when I tell you, Sally appreciates you being there, but Sally's going to appreciate you a hell of a lot more. Uh, you know, when you take her to Disney World or when you have more financial security or when her college is paid for or when Christmas rolls around, there's presents under the tree, right? Yeah, yeah. Isn't that the job of a parent? Isn't yep. job number one is to make the path for your children easier? Yeah. And yet people fight with that. Adults mm-hmm. fight with that. They're not, there's no connectiveness to that uh, sense yeah. of responsibility. I, I'm a big guy about living by my calendar. I live by my calendar. What it says what I'm going to do. I schedule out the vacations for the whole year. I know what I'm doing every single day of 2021. I've already sat down and mapped it out. I can tell you my vacations. I know what I'm going to do. And so you got it. You got to have a plan. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail by definition. Here's one for you. You want to change your life? It's the old acronym. And I know you know this one, the BHAG, right? Big, right? You know, do you know Go what ahead. that is? Go ahead. It's the big, hairy, audacious school. When I got mad, and I was a Remax agent, I had a bunch of deals fall to escrow, and I'd been my fourth year in real estate. Uh, by the way, that year I made three hundred ninety-three thousand dollars, but it was the month of June. Every escrow I had either canceled or fell out because of the mortgage, or the buyer got cold feet, or the home inspection went bad. And deal after deal after deal fell to escrow, and I'm facing summer as a sole income provider with nothing in escrow. And I just paid off my credit cards, and it's a sick feeling because you got your wife looks at you and goes, "What's closing next? What do you have an escrow?" And you're like, "Well, nothing, honey." And if it takes you two or three weeks to put something in escrow, and thirty to forty-five days, God forbid, to close it, you. You go in July and August all summer without income, which really sucks. Then you got to ask your brother or your mama, mommy and daddy for some cash to buy groceries. I got pissed. I'm just going to say it. Not at Dave Linegar, the billionaire owner of Remax. Not at Gary Keller. Not at anybody, my sales manager. Not at my wife or kids, but at me. I'm like, forget this. I'm better than this. And I, I was at that point, I'd kind of mastered open houses and I was out there doing it. I had lots of clients. So I said, that does it. I asked, I said, honey, can I just go for it in July? Can I like, can you just unleash me for like 30 days? Like just Dad needs to go kill stuff and drag it home to mama. Not that we're going to kill our clients. I love my clients, but you get the, the attitude. Check yeah, it out. Totally. So I set a goal to sell 30 homes in 30 days. That one goal, it, it'll like, how are you going to do that? I didn't know either. But by setting the goal, it created the sense of urgency where I bounce out of bed at 630 in a cold sweat because today i got to show property, do something, write an offer, put somebody in escrow today. Now, well, this weekend, hopefully I'll show some property. Hopefully I'll go on a listing appointment in the next week or two, couple listing appointments. Oh my God, where's your sense of urgency? Where's you? I mean, I was desperate, not in a needy way, but in a healthy way where you're, you're just desperate to not want to be in a position where you're borrowing money from your relatives or charging up your credit cards. you just like, I'm better than this. And so guess what? That goal changed my life. That month I sold, I didn't hit the goal. I sold 14 homes. My record part of that month was seven in escrow. And I thought that was amazing. I used to be so proud of that. And I usually do three or four in escrow. Seven. That month I did 14. I didn't hit the goal. I didn't even get halfway there. Only 14 homes in a month. It was the first time I made a, basically 100000 in a month. It was the first time I realized, you know what? I can pretty much do what I want to do here. And and then be, selling seven homes a month was like a cakewalk. Because it's like you stretch your comfort zone out there larger and larger. And it became easy. And I changed that month. And I'm telling you, the next 
30 days could change your life if you said if you're a door knocker you call expireds you do open houses you're you're buying buffini you're joe stump by referral and whatever it is you do set some crazy insane goal and go for it you will never be the same and you will get what i call the big mo everything you touch turns to gold you get momentum you know what it's like to close a home every other day for an entire month I'm telling you what, it'll change your life. And you start believing in you, not that you're God's gift to humanity, but you're like, God gave me gifts, and I'm going to share that with humanity, and I'm going to love people. I'm going to show up big time. I'm going to be a light in a dark hill, a city on a hill, a lamp on a stand. I'm going to be a light in the darkness. I'm going to bring hope and love. And when I enter a room, I'm going to bring energy and smiles and love. And they're going to be excited to see me instead of coming in with thunder clouds and lightning bolts like, oh, crud, Brent's here again. I'm going to come to love and to give. And when you get your mindset right, like Tony Robbins talks about, and you, you get it going like Zig Ziglar and Dennis Wheatley talks about, baby, look out. And the only person holding you back is you. You take full responsibility for your life. So I'm like the agent whisperer. So I just wrote down, I think I encapsulated what you said. And okay. I, correct me if any of these are wrong. I like that last point you made because it's really, it is really truly the bottom line. If you want to be successful, you just, the action leads to the motivation, right? Bingo. So if you take the action, you learn along the way. And you said something else. You said this several times. That's really an, an incredibly important thing. It's actually something I read originally in a um, uh, book written by Navy SEALs. Right, so when Navy SEALs are forward deployed and they're downrange and they're doing their thing and they're in this one in this book, I don't remember which book it was, but they're talking about walking in this horribly cold, you know, they couldn't see ahead of them. They weren't even sure where they're gonna put their next foot, a uh, next step. And they said what they focus on there and this is how they're trained to think. They don't think outside of their three foot world, right? So a three foot world's tiny, right? They're only focusing on what's immediately in front of them, around them, behind them. They're not worried about anything that's beyond that. And so that goes back to the get into action and the motivation will follow. There's a fallacy in, um, and I think it's all from the mindset movement personally, but there's a fallacy that you have to work on your mindset before you get into action, which results in people constantly saying, I can't do it because I have to work on my mindset. I have to perfect my dream board. Right. I have to work on my passion. I have to find my big why. Find those things along the way. And by the way, the, whatever you come, what, come up with as far as your, whatever your motivation is, Whatever you think it is before you get started on your journey, it's not going to be the same thing after you've taken a few steps because things are going to change. The environment's going to change. Everything's going to look different to you, feel different to you. So stop looking to feel a certain way. Just get into action. Your feelings will follow, which you do intuitively. That's what you do naturally. Haven't you found that to be a common element of, amongst successful people? Absolutely. They fail forward is another yeah. way of saying it. Progress before perfection. Right. Execution trumps strategy all day long. Yep. Just get going. You'll figure it out. You get a little better, a little better. And pretty soon you are you're light. You're on fire. You get done with the listing appointment. You just, it was like, it was like a, a, the wall. So everything went is, it was like, man, I wish someone could have videotaped that. That was money. It was spot on and it becomes fun and easy. And, and that's a pretty wonderful spot in life. So, um, this goes to a couple little interesting thoughts. So if someone's listening, they're, they're vibing with what we're saying, what we're saying, but they're saying, well, okay, what the hell am I supposed to do? And this is where coaching enters in there. This mm -hmm. is where, well, let's just make, you want to loop it back to uh, revenue share? Sure. Okay. This is where choosing your mentor matters. Because if you choose a mentor, that's not the type of person that you are hoping to be. If you have, it's essentially this, it's now look, you can look in EXP, they show you how to go about, you know, if, if Brent isn't your mentor, you know, maybe he's you know, in your, in your, you know, ment your revenue share Partner. family, yeah. right? He's one of your partners and you can move up and you can find him and you can ask him a question. But the reality of it is, is that who you choose as your mentor matters the same as who you choose to be your coach matters the same as who you choose to listen to matters because Time is too precious. It passes by too quick. And if you align with people that are not the person that you want to be, you're going to lose years, if not decades. And here's the, how heinous that is, in my opinion. A lot of times, especially in what Julie and I do for a living, we see people get real estate licenses and they latch on to really what it amount to 
fluff as far as lead generation mostly. Or they're told you got to form a team or they're, you're, you're being told all these things. And there's places maybe for all those things, but they're never told the truth. Well, like, well, hopefully, I think the listeners will agree we're talking about now. Yeah, we've, never, we've been raw. <laughs> yeah, well, but it's true. They're never told to do what they don't. They're never told it's, oh, you have to feel uncomfortable. Like when we're, Julie and I are in front of a group, depending on the group, I always like to say, if you're not hearing the word no at least five times a day and not from your spouse, your dogs, your kids, because... I hear no at least 10 times a day from all three of those sources. Right, I don't know right, about you, right. right? But if you're not hearing no from you call, someone, <laughs> right? You call your dog, get over here, Ralph. He looks at you and goes the other direction. Yeah, exactly. Maximus, actually. Yeah, but Maximus, he's, yeah, he yeah. totally, he'll look at me and I'll go the other way, <laughs> right? So that's a no from a dog, right. right? So, but if you're not putting yourself in a position to hear no at least five times a day, no from hypoth- you know, ideally a seller, you're not doing your job. You're not you, prospecting. You will, you're not doing anything, really. Yeah. You're not only not prospecting, you're not putting yourself in a position to actually have heard and that right there if you if if you think about all the mickey mouse that's being told and sold to agents nowadays it's all predicated on the idea that they are like fragile little you know faberge eggs and they're fearful of hearing the word no that they might you know break and and Mm -hmm. how they can put themselves back together they're totally living in fear of hearing no and which is the same reason in my opinion that they'll sometimes say i don't want to sponsor agents or recruit agents it's the fear of hearing no What, what do you think about that I agree totally. So I wrote down some thoughts for you guys. If you want to succeed, A, if you're not a part of Tim and Julie's coaching program, you should do that. Um, if not that, then do something else. But I've always been, I, I went to uh, Brian Buffini. I went to Craig Proctor. I went to Remax Convention, uh, Mega Camp, Family Union. I signed up. Remember Star Power, Howard and Brenton? Julie and I are Howard Britain stars. Yes. Yeah. I, 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 I got there. From 90. And then he shut it down 90s. after I showed up. He goes, oh, yeah. forget it. Did he, were you a Howard star? I, I got there and went to one event, and then he retired and sold the company, sold Star Power oh, right yeah, after yeah. I got there. But my point is this. Go to stuff like that. Go to Masterminds. I'm doing one in Cabo, Mastermind in the Tropics in Cabo. we got 1,100 people coming this February. But go and interrogate people. Look at who's speaking. I remember Leonard Fazio. Do you even know the name? Mm-hmm. He was selling 600 homes a year in Iowa, and I heard him speak on stage along with 800 people, and everyone's glad handing him, and which they do. I do the same thing. You shake, oh, that was sure great. I go, hey, can I take you to lunch with my dad? My dad was with me. He goes, sure. And we spent an hour with him at lunch. Everybody else heard him speak on stage. And I go, what about this? 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 And he sat there and coached me for an hour, and I bought him like a $12 taco, <laughs> you know, and a Diet Coke. Start asking people to meet you for coffee or meet you for brunch or uh, lunch. It's who you meet at those events. And then when you meet the stars, go, can I fly out to your office? I met the number one Coldwell Banker agent in the world, Jay Kender, lot in Oklahoma. I didn't know Jay. I go, Jay, can I fly out to your office and just watch you for a day? He goes, sure. I went to Lot. It's like population 120,000. It's a military town. He goes, let's go to dinner. And we went to the only restaurant, the Golden Corral. And you know, we got there and had dinner. But I interrogated Jay and I copied him. And I copied his radio. And I spent 15 years on the radio after meeting with Jay, over a million dollars. And I got all my listings from the radio. And people call me up and say, hey, would you list my million dollar home? 6%, right? I go, Sure, you know, and I was like, but I copied someone, everything I did, but I was willing to fly to Toronto, fly to Orlando, fly to Denver. I went to an event in Denver. It's horrible. They're not all going to be good. I've joined coaching programs that I thought were horrible, but guess what? I went to some that were phenomenal. I went to some coaching that was great. I'm a guy who's willing to try and then interrogate people, ask a million questions. I'd stop there. So when you're trying to decide something, because you're saying something that agents listening, they're now going to say, I need to inundate myself with more data points. I need to fill my head with a whole bunch of competing ideas. And then somehow I need to magically know how to weave together this killer business plan. Whereas the, on the other side of that is more procrastination. And it's it, they're think for some, like someone's a school teacher and they automatically think if they go and shadow you and they shadow all these other people, or it was called shadowing in the 90s, remember? Before coaching, before the internet. Yeah. You know, they think somehow they're going to have the business acumen to be able to put together a business plan by taking little bird dropping samples from all these different sources. And that's what leads, to, that's one of the biggest reasons that people fail. Right. So I'll suggest I, 100% what you said, but the bottom line is, is you have to choose what your ultimate goal is because much of what's being taught to agents and i'd love to debate this if you'd like to debate it but i know i have a feeling you won't or the profit is not even part of the uh, out of the picture back when brent and i were you know in the 90s and all these marketing and branding and you know all this direct marketing all this stuff now that you guys think is new is coming around the bend it, that's when it all sort of you know craig proctor was dan kennedy and all the rest of this stuff we were back in the form formidable 
formative age of all these things now that have become popularized and normalized. Some of those things back then did make money because it wasn't, it wasn't oversaturated. But nowadays, if you start latching yourself on to some of these ideas that people are trying to sell you, you might sell more houses and you might get the plaques, the attention, and people might think you're a real estate deity, but you have no profit. Yeah. Because you have to decide really well, what that's you're... That's like, the, but you got to be selling homes to make profit, right? So first you got to learn how to sell some homes. And I'll say this, when you go to these things, you gr- I would grab one or two things. Like what I got out of Jay Kinder's office, he was selling 600 homes a year and I pretty much boiled it down to, he was getting a ton of it from the radio. So I implemented one thing, not so many things. And it worked great. I well, killed it But on let me radio. challenge you on that. If okay. you're running radio ads, because I've had coaching calls like this before, where they're running crap tons of radio. Radio works inconsistently, but better than most things that are passive. Agreed completely. Yeah. The radio station format changes. The DJ changes. It goes from Christian to country. You might be, you know, there goes your listenership. And it also depends on very specific sure. time spots in the morning. And your ad, obviously. We'll have a bunch of risk reversal types things, okay? But the problem with radio ultimately is if you don't have a high enough average sale price, what your cost is going to increase, your profits are going to decrease. Because you're cur- making a great point. I'm in Sacramento. There's no where I have high sales price. Right. There's no and profit. And all that. Oh, I, uh, I, I made money. I made well, money. No, no. Gross versus net. I'm, I netted a lot of money, so it depends upon where you're living. That we'll agree to disagree, but yeah. I'll tell you this: well, it's the sale price. Okay, so the, the sales price thing. in California yeah. is high. Yeah. So if you try to copy me, it's just like eight hundred. Yeah, right, yeah. right, right, right. So um, I, I will tell you this: uh, I ran ads on radio twice and failed twice. I did the weekend show like Jay was doing, and it went okay. And they said it's going to take six months, and I was spending. 14,000 a month. I was already obviously making good money just to drop 14 grand a month on radio weekend show. And I wasn't really successful for half a year. They said it's going to take half a year. And guess what? They were right. Um, and so finally, what, and then I did it for years. And then pretty soon I got more and more and more. So there's that, there's that return. It starts growing. But what did it for me was when I made an ad and I, a one ad, and it was like, um, and I copied a dog trainer, Uncle Maddie. He goes, call me Uncle Maddie. I'll talk to you personally. And man, I'll be dang it if everyone didn't call Uncle Maddie to get their dog trained. He'd charge you six grand to train your dog. Six grand people lined up to pay Uncle Maddie. So I copied him. I did my ad. I picked on Zillow. I said, some of you Zillow drives you crazy. You know, it's either too high or too low. And you're like, and you're right. They don't know. It's an algorithm. It spits out a value in one second. I said, if you call me, I'm a professional. I'll tell you what your home's worth in this market. So call me Brent Gove. I'll talk to you personally. Exactly like the tone of Uncle Matty, the dog trainer. I, cu- I called him. I couldn't believe I want to train my dog. Six grand? Are you kidding me? And people line up to pay him. So guess what? People line up to give me listings. When I learned to run in one particular ad, you're right, times change this and that. But um, I struck a nerve in the community and my phone blew up. And that's where I learned to get 18 to 28 listings from that. It was way more. You know what the ads cost me? 2800 a month. I was carrying 18 to 28 listings. I was flat making money. Now, it depends upon where you live and yep. what you're spending and that. I happened to get an ad that killed it, and it was just struck a chord. I failed. Other stuff was not as good. But do, you that, remember, do you remember Russell Shaw? He's still, yeah, Russell yeah, Shaw, sure. He's awesome, right? Yeah. All these ads that these guys are running nowadays are still based on Russell's ads from the 90s. I and mean, that guy's a freaking yeah. genius. What, yeah. where, I Scott based Stale? mine off a dog trainer. Scott what, Stale, whatever whatever it trained. takes. You know, but, there's, there was a guy in Columbus, Ohio, when Julie and I were selling real estate that used to sell radio ads, got his real estate license, started to selling real estate, doing radio ads. And his whole thing was testimonial, testimonial, testimonial. And then at the end, and at the end of every testimonial, I think his name was Mike. They go like, thanks, Mike. And so he, he was the thanks Mike guy, and that really worked for him. Oh, I thought beautiful. that was funny. Totally. But, but again, it, when you're, the problem, again, that I'll suggest, obviously radio works. I didn't say it didn't, but you have to make sure you're watching your numbers. Otherwise, what you're going to continue to do is spend money and have no profit. I agree. Yeah. And then at the end of the, you know, end of the year, you might even be operating at a deficit, and then you've never done, you don't have any proactive lead generation, which at, by definition doesn't cost you anything set up. Maybe you've never learned to do it. Maybe you've convinced yourself that it takes too much time, whatever. And then you're always going to be beholden to buying business. And being beholden to buying business essentially means that you're never going to have a very consistent business, yeah, ultimately. that's true. Yeah. I mean, so, yeah. I used to make 500 to a million a year net on my tax return. But I, I, when I sold 427 homes in California, made 3.8 million gross GCI. I netted 1.2. That was it. I was happy with that. Now, you may go, that's terrible. Me, I was happy. I love my life. Oh, my God. You had how many buyer's agents? I had 45 buyer's agents. And this was in 2005 before teams were sexy. And um, But I'm like, I w- oh, isn't that a nightmare? No, it's fun. I don't. How do you manage them? I don't. 
They're independent contractors. I'd let them do whatever the heck they want. A lot of people have a hard time running a shop like that. I, I'm loosey goosey. So whatever. I don't micromanage people. Do whatever. It's sink or swim. I want you to swim. I want you to prosper. I want you to do well. But if you drown, that's on you. I'm giving you the motivation, the information, the inspiration. If you drown, it's on you. I didn't feel. Don't you feel responsible for them? Not a bit. Yeah, that is actually that's very that's a fascinating approach to it too because they're like as far as the ego involvement for a lot of these teams and whatnot. You know, it, but it is everything has the the old rules with the teams and all these types of things. It really has evolved over time. Yeah. And I'll tell you one of the things uh, that I really like about EXP is EXP has made it so that it's actually more profitable to run a team if you want to keep your team, or if you have an existing brokerage you want to move over to EXP. Oh it actually God. makes it so you can make more profit. I know. Is it? Can funny? I can I cover that? Oh, when absolutely. I ran my team at Remax, I was paying them. I had to pay for all the offices. I had eight private offices. Had thirteen full time employees. Had four. 45 buyers agents. I ran it all with eight private offices. By the time I paid the office fees and paid the admin fee, I'm a 100% agent with Remax, so it couldn't have cost me much, right? I added it all up. It was $457,000 a year to operate at Remax. Now, since then, they've got more competitive. That's flat as a fact, but it was $457,000 a year in overhead to Remax. So I go to Keller Williams. They have, they go, well, we're only a $27,000 cap. I'm like, okay. And when I went to Keller Williams, guess how many agents I had left in 2009? in the middle of the crash I had like eight mm. 45 to eight what happened to the rest they all went bankrupt lost their homes they lost their uh, Chevy Tahoes and their Cadillac Escalades and their BMW they lost everything it was really brutal in Sacramento California Las Vegas Phoenix and Florida we took it on the chin and so here's here's the bottom line is um, we I came there it was 18,000 an agent I built it up to 14 agents so do the math do you have a math what's 14,000 times 18,000 I think it's $170,000 a year Mrs. Gove can you check that's our math that's what it is you get a calculator <laughs> I'll do it on my phone let's do it right now let's just do it I'll be quick I'm going to be fast so come on open for me close low power so here's a calculator you ready for this I had 14 agents at Keller Williams times 18,000. They called that a half cap, which is funny. Half of 27,000 is not 18,000. That was a half cap. It's 13,500, whatever. All right, so times 14. That's we're, real, we're real estate oh, people. Oh, $252,000, a quarter of a million to Keller Williams. Yep. Then I paid 27 plus 27,000 equals, I'm paying 279,000 to Keller Williams. I was 457. I was elated to only pay him this number. At, at, at EXP, our caps are 16 for the lead agent and 8 for the buyer's agents. It was actually half a cap. Half of 16 is 8. If you're a mega team and you're doing over, um, uh, what is it, um, 175 sales a year. Or 40 million. Or 40 million. You, your buyer's agents uh, get to come. It's not or, it's and actually. Yeah, and, and. You have to do over 175 transactions and 40 million a year. Um, it's 4,000. Ten, pe- 10 people. A team of 10 or more. Yep. It's 4,000 an agent. Yep. So if you have 10 people, that's 40 grand plus your 60, it's 56,000 a year versus I just was paying 257. to think about that? So I went to Keller and said, I'm going to go. I, my agents are tired of paying all this money. I'm out of here. No, no, no. And then they just took it and cut it in half. They, they dropped the price and made it more competitive. But I'm still paying like 180,000 a year. So to run a team at EXP, it was a fraction of the cost. Everybody got stock awards. A lot of them got revenue share, not all of them, because some of them didn't recruit. They just sold. But my agents who sold about 30 to 40 homes a year, today they have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of stock. Well, that won't happen. Are you kidding me? It's just we did all this started. with 36,000 agents. Wait till yeah. we have 100,000 the value of that stock. It's going to be exciting. You know, we, you, talk, you always talk about a bunch of different things at once, and I have to pull out the things I think our Sorry. listeners will like the more. No, it's okay. You fed me four cups of coffee. I know. I did. Your lovely wife did. <laughs> but so, I mean, the reality of it is is that well, I'm just curious. The, who of all the people you've ever talked, you've maybe personally sponsored, let's say, because um, I think in EXP, you and I personally have sponsored more people than anybody else has. Individually. Possibly. It's yeah. possible. I don't, I don't know, know if it's for sure, but that's what I've been told. Yeah. So in all those conversations... How someone moving over to EXP? What was the most amount of money that they saved over their current or their, over what then became their previous brokerage? Because I think I have a number that's it's the biggest number I've ever heard. No, I've never really sat down and calculated what they saved, so I, I don't know how to quantify that. But what's yours? Uh, he basically was paying his broker about four hundred thousand dollars a year, and you dropped him to sixteen. 
Wow. So just the horizontal move saved him three hundred and eighty four thousand dollars a year. Basically, if I did the math, right? yeah, yeah, that's pretty yeah. good. You're smiling. I wish you could see Timmy smiling. No, no, you because feel good I, about yourself. Well, that's, it's that's because it, I was about to say because he and he basically he's a coaching client and he basically made me work for it for like six months before he switched over, even though he was going to save that much more money. And here's the thing that's magical that's happened after this. This year, and Chuck, yes, I am talking about you. I know you're listening. He's having his best year ever. I think he's going to make something like $2 million oh, yeah. Yeah. because he's so much more excited and yeah. motivated for his business, and he has stock, and he's making uh, revenue yeah. share. Yeah. Everybody thinks they need Century 21 or Berkshire Hathaway or Remax or Keller Williams or Sotheby's or whoever it is. You all think you need that. No, 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 no. I thought I needed a Remax selling 427 homes a year. I can't go to Keller Williams. And then I finally did in 2009. Things were so bad. I stooped to the level of checking out Keller Williams. And, of course, Remax said it would destroy my career. They were wrong. Keller, uh, Keller Williams told EXP would destroy my career. Life changing for my kids' kids. They were wrong. But here's the deal. When I left Remax for Keller Williams, everyone's like, well, what is that? And Sacramento wasn't big. They're like, is, uh, uh, well, uh, they're like, is that a paint company? I'm like, no, that's Sherman Williams. And they didn't care. I used to think everyone cared about it. They go, well, do you like it? Yeah, it's good enough for me. Nobody cared. I didn't lose any business. And then when I left Keller Williams with DXP, everyone's like, what's that? It was just like I went from Remax to Keller Williams, a no-name company. Keller Williams was a no-name company when I made the brand. I mean, the agents had heard of it, but the customers, the clients in Sacramento, they literally thought it was a paint company. I'd lost my mind. I said, no, it's Keller Williams. So out of Austin, Texas, I'd have to tell them the story about Geller Keller. Same thing. I'd tell the same story. They didn't care. They're like, hey, if it's good for you and you're happy, then fine. They do, but you do not need your brand. If you think you need your brand, you're a new agent yep. or you are deceived. You, you just, I mean, I got to be honest with you. I was doing 400 sales a year and I thought Remax was good. It's a good brand. You see their well, commercials. I mean, Remax is a it great It is a company. good brand. Yeah, and so is company. Keller Williams and all sure. the other companies. But you I wasn't getting the business because of the balloon. Yeah, no. Or the it, blue and white from Cobalt Banker. You think you are. You're no, not. but that is a fascinating point, though, too. And it doesn't matter. I, I had a thing stuck in my head about a year ago with regards to the fact that you maybe, if you were selling luxury real estate, that you needed to have a luxury brand. But I've since had people that were selling really expensive real estate, yes. really expensive markets move over, and their business has not suffered at all. Because at the end of the day, nobody cares. Real estate brands had their day in the sun. Oh, like yeah. So you and I go back to basically the same era, yeah. which is like a billion years ago when people were living in right, caves, right? Right, right. I mean, Century 21 was the cat's, you know, that cat's was... That's meow. Exactly. Thank you. Okay. And then it, then it basically merged into a couple different things. But really, we can say that the next era was the era of Remax. Dave Lindiger put the agent first, increased commissions. And to go to Remax, you know, you're generally speaking at the top of your career. Yep. And then you saw another mega trend enter in, which was uh, Keller Williams. And Absolutely. These, and these mega trends happened to last. They seem to last. We've thought about this 25 years or so. And they're still, they still have agents and whatnot, but then basically there's something else that comes along that sort of replaces it. And most trends in life are like that, right? And, and just even out in life in general. You know, like you're wearing bell bottoms right now, which I can't quite yeah, understand. Yeah, right. He's lying. <laughs> but I mean, those are the types He's of- He's wearing a plaid jacket. That's Actually, a, that's back no, in style, no, I think. <laughs> no, mine's a gold jacket. I'm wearing my uh, yeah, 21 yeah, right. jacket. So, so, so you're, that, the EXP definitely is a mega trend. Yep. It's not just, it's not just something that's gonna come and go. EXP is basically something that's going to, this is going to be the thing for the next, you know, 25 or 30 years. And in essence, now EXP has been around for a decade, but in essence, the biggest growth, and this is, I, I think this, and I just, I feel so, honestly, I feel blessed. Um, I'm not going to say lucky because Gene Frederick always smacks me upside the head verbally when I say lucky, but I do feel blessed uh, to have finally gotten past whatever was holding me and Julie back from aligning with the XP because this is what it feels like to be in the right place at the right time. Now, I felt that at other times when I met Julie, when I got married, when we did other business things, that felt special. And, and I think in life, you're only given maybe if you're lucky five, but realistically three big opportunities and you blow any of those opportunities, there's no guarantee another one's going to come around. For you and I, certainly, and I say this hoping you live another thousand years, me too, right? But this is probably our last best business opportunity. Not our last, but our last best business opportunity. If you're 12 and you're listening now, hopefully you're going to come across a few others. But for a vast majority of you listening, EXP very well could be your last best business opportunity because of the growth is just getting started. 
And, and this is going to be a mega trend. That's, it's already global. This, it, what is, you know this better than me. Isn't eXp the largest real estate brokerage in the world now by geographic reach or something? Is I that, heard something like that. Yeah, I can't verify I that. Can't but verify. here's why it's going to be a big deal. Last week, I had two agents, one's from Vietnam, one's from Thailand. They're both so excited that's and awesome. so connected to Vietnam. They want to bring eXp to Thailand, uh, Thailand and Vietnam. Another one last week, she's a broker in Manila and in San Francisco. Wow. She wants to bring eXp to Manila. I already had brokers that with the 140 agents in South Africa opened. They all came in one week. Uh, Portugal, um, France, Brazil, India. We're blowing up in India. And I get paid on home sales in Canada, Australia, the UK, every you know, the, every state in the nation because I took a chance. And so I want to encourage you, take a chance. This is a special time. A friend of mine out of college went to San Jose State, got a degree in accounting like anybody else has a boring degree in accounting. Couldn't get a job. He finally took a job, minimum wage. His parents like, it's been three months. You graduated three months. Just take a job, any job, just get some experience. So he took a job with nine guys working out of an apartment in their underwear. You know, they're like in sweatsuits. We're going to, our company will be big someday. Five years later, that company went public. He was their CFO. We'll give you a title. You are the chief financial officer, but we, we can't afford to pay you. But we, by law, we have to give you a minimum wage. He's a CFO making minimum wage. But hey, we'll give you stock like EXP, right? Our stock used to be a penny stock, yeah. right? He, that company went public, became Yahoo. His stock was worth $170 million. That was 30 years ago, 25 years ago. He's traveled the world for 25 years. Right time, right place. I tell you what, for me, I've never felt like this. And we are just getting started. We're going to be the first company to have a million agents worldwide. All we've done is pave the roads. We've been on gravel roads with potholes, and we paved the roads. We paved the on-ramp to the interstate. Your timing could not be better, if you listen to this podcast, to do EXP with Tim and Julie, myself, and others. And we could name names of well, people. We that were, were you, yeah. uh, Jay Kinder's group, and Julie and I were, were by some website I'd never heard of, frankly. But they called us. I sent this to you. They called us the three. Uh, I, I'm hesitant in saying this, but they gave us the title of basically being the three teams to take a hard look at if you're thinking about joining EXP. Huh, never heard of that. I sent that to James. Huh, Maybe I sent it to you. Very cool. Yeah, it was cool. And I thanked him. And I never, like but I said, I always cool. show people. Call your best friend at eXp and take a deep dive. Whether you call Tim and Julie, me, Jay Kinder, whoever, yep. call your best friend at eXp and take a hard well, look. Well, they can call us too and we'll help them. And the totally. first question you always ask totally. them is, are you already in conversation with somebody? And it doesn't matter. If you are, then we're going to we're gonna answer your questions. We're going to you know, yeah. probably message the person you're already talking to and tell them about the conversation and loop them back in and help you. Yeah. I mean, yeah. That, but that's the whole, that's what eXp does. One team, one dream, baby. That's true. I mean, the stock, the, the revenue share, all those things, that's the genius of it. Of it too because you essentially light the animal spirits and the you know the souls and the recesses of everyone's mind that's the thing that you can't understand until you're actually involved yeah. in it can i i want there was a couple called the matthews in texas they were selling 880 homes a year they inspired me they were remax agents back in 2004 or 5 i was chasing them i was at half their volume i'm poultry 427 sales a year which 318 of those were people we met at open houses by the way in one year 318 closes from open houses which are free and uh uh, he just got to get out there and work. But here's the deal. They inspired me. But what did it mean to me financially? Nothing. They inspired me, which is vital. But nothing. And, and and when I was at Keller Williams, I remember this guy selling a billion a year in real estate. Ken DeLeon or something. He's the number one Keller Williams agent from San Francisco, San Jose. Sold 20, 30, 40, 50, 80 million dollar homes. Incredible story. Great guy. He inspired me. But what did it mean to me financially? Nothing. At EXP, when you meet those same people and they're blowing it up in New York and Florida and Texas and wherever they are, guess what? It makes EXP more valuable. Who owns the stock? You do, Tim. I do, and every agent at EXP that's won a stock award. As that stock award went from two dollar from twenty cents a share to eighty cents a year, quad, quadrupled to a buck sixty. When I got in, it was two ninety. Today it's trading at fifty something dollars a share. We're a three billion dollar company. We went from like fifty million to three billion in three years. Oh, baby! How are you doing? You need more coffee? You good? No, I'm. I'm. I'm excited, but it's not about money. I love people, and money's a byproduct Definitely. of service and value. Definitely, that's what I got to say. Yeah, well, it's something I wrote down earlier, but you said it. Yeah. I mean, if you don't have the lifestyle, if you don't have the things, if you don't have the freedom, if you don't have the sense of accomplishment, the sense of meaning, the sense of whatever it is that you feel like you're lacking in your life, 
it's because you haven't bridged the gap between the realization, I say this respectfully and lovingly, listeners, so, you know, between there's a direct correlation between the number of people that you help and the amount of, and, and the, the nature of your experience on this planet. And a lot of people, especially in this, you know, strange time that we're all living in, they have a, um, they're confused about being materialistic. And I want to do my best, and I learned this from Deepak Chopra, to try to clear the air. We are spiritual beings in physical manifestations. And as we're sitting here looking over the ocean, I'm trying not to look as it totally distracts yeah. me, right? Doesn't it? Palm trees are waving I in know. the tropical breeze. You know, but we are, fit, we are spiritual beings in physical manifestations and we need stuff. You know, we need an iPhone to record this podcast. We need shoes on our feet, food in our belly. We need a roof over our head. So you might as well make it so that you have the nicest stuff that you will allow yourself to afford. And if you don't have the nicest stuff that you allow yourself to afford, it's because you simply haven't helped enough people yet. And now, obviously, in real estate, it's helping more people, solving a problem, which is buying or selling a house and helping somebody do it. But the nice thing about what Glenn Sanford has created is you help people just by bringing them into EXP because they're then improving their lives because this uh, this beautiful system that is already there for you to leverage, which is called EXP. And then you get this thing called exponential growth, not just in your finances, but in all the things that need that mean the most to you. You now have a sense of purpose and a sense of direction. And it's a, it's like a rebirth. Wouldn't you agree? Am I overstating Absolutely. it? Absolutely. I, th- I think you're pulling me into your mindset world, which I'm trying to resist. Ah. But doesn't it feel like that, honestly? It is. I'm so excited. It's incredible. Here's what some of you think. You may think, I just don't know if I can do it. When it gets in the court, you may be doubting your ability to do it. Let me ask you a question. Do you think Tim and Julie Harris can do it? Well, yeah, of course they can do it. That's the point. They're going to help you do it. I'm going to help you do it. Aren't we doing that now? Yes. we're, We're begging them to step up in their mindset, in other ways, in the way they think. And so, you know, when I was a REMAX agent, the sales manager would answer my questions or the broker from time to time. But basically, I was out there, you know, humping and pumping and grinding and, and doing what I did. And that was me doing those open houses. That was me on my knees in Antelope, California, praying to God for him to send someone in the front door of that open house. That was me going to events that I couldn't always afford to go to to learn about real estate. And it wasn't my sales manager. It wasn't Remax. And, and, and yeah, Keller Williams kind of added masterminds and, and more collaboration. It was amazing. I loved it. To me, I found it a more uh, educationally enlightening environment. I'm a student of life. I'm a student of real estate. And Keller Williams really embodied that. And then EXP takes that times 10. No, it doesn't. You haven't been here. You don't get it. And so you may be doubting whether you could do it. Call Tim and Julie. Feel free to call me. Call your friend. They will help you. We will help you do it. Even Don't doubt you, us. If there's you a can't. local EXP agent and you uh, are friends with that agent, you want that agent to sponsor you, but you still, I'm going to say this again because it's really important. Even if we have no, like, even if you don't want to be sponsored by Brent or by Julie and I, it's okay. Ask us for help and we'll help you. Yes. We're doing that right now for you. Hopefully you're understanding the point of it. But that really goes to the sense of community. And this is something I professionally have never experienced before. And I'll and let me share a personal unreal. experience. It is unreal. So we, Julie and I, uh, went to. Uh, I didn't. So I was still on the fence about joining EXP. And Julie, as everyone who listens to our show, is much smarter than me. And she wanted to join EXP. And we went down to an event that was in San Antonio, someplace. A little EXP thing that uh, Gene. I don't think you were there. You weren't there. And but Gene had put together. And I remember. And Julie and I have hosted, provided, gone to. I don't even know how many real estate events. It just if I never go to a real estate event again. I'm good. But at that event, I experienced something I'd never personally experienced before. And it was the power of the true, not the, not the bullshit community that everyone talks about, but it was real because people were essentially all feeling this sense of uh, a real attachment to a greater, brighter future. Uh, and they're all working together as a community. And that's something I, outside of truthfully, outside of church, I've never experienced that. And it was something for me that was like, this is what I've always wanted to be associated with, attached to, what we hope they get from uh, being associated with is our coaching business. But the difference that Glenn had created that I couldn't, and this is the thing that ultimately push, uh, pushed me over the ledge, the ledge, the edge, the threshold, whatever it was to make the decision, was when I remember talking to normal agents there that were you know, sporadic in home sales, maybe they're selling eight or 10 houses, but they had passive income enough to pay their house payment. 
They had a sense of financial security that they never would have had in their entire lives. And I just talked to these people. And Julie and I walked into this room and we sat on different sides because we get recognized less when we're not together. So we always, and she, she was having these conversations, man on the street interviews, and I was on the other side. We weren't announced. No one knew we were there. We sat in the back room and we went to have coffee and we talked to everyone. And that sense of, um, you know, the monkey no longer being on their back, the ones that either were making revenue share, were making money from the stock and obviously selling real estate, that financial burden not being there anymore, at least not being as omnipresent in their lives was something that I wanted to be attached to because that was giving something, not just education, not getting them to act, just getting them to action, but Glenn had created something that created, that uh, made up for their natural inability to save money and ever have any kind of retirement plan. It's the two things agents do poorly, pay their taxes and save money, right? So Glenn fixed both of those things. So I knew if we applied, or at least I hoped if we applied our education to helping him sell real estate and with what Glenn had created inside this amazing business, then we had the perfect overall approach to helping agents, which was in alignment with what we wanted. So that's what made the difference for me. And it wasn't, the money obviously was, ansel- well, it's important. I'm not going to say it's not, but knowing that there's so many people that are benefiting from it in meaningful ways. I mean, I grew up poor, right? And I know that when I was growing up that my dad had, you know, many, many small businesses, but we never had any, really any money. I mean, a, a, you know, that's a long story short. And so if my dad had had 2000 or $3,000 coming in per month passively, that would have changed the world for us when we were little kids. That would have changed everything. And I always remember that. I remember, you know, what that how how much that sucks not to have money when you're a little kid, you oh, know, yeah. and that's what I attach to. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Um, you you touched on something earlier that I think is really important. People have a desire for community. You, you mentioned the word community. They have a desire to join a tribe, a group of people who are like minded, going somewhere. In other words, I think people want to join a movement when they really get mm-hmm. swept up in that movement. So let me ask you a question: What do you feel like? is the movement where you work at your real estate company. What movement are you a part of? Well, just trying to go from 20 sales a year to 40. I'm trying to go from 40 to 80. I'm trying to go from 80 to 200. And, 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 and really, really accomplishing. Who's really helping you? And that, to me, is the difference with EXP. When you come to EXP events, and you should go to an event, come to Cabo in February at the Hyatt Ziva, 1,100 of us who are sick of COVID-19. Yeah. And, and we're using uh, social distancing and all the – it's Hyatt Regency. They're, they're doing the safety protocols. It'll all be done properly. Right, go for resources, right? Yeah, yeah. If you want to get a ticket, we're opening up 500 more this week, brentgoveresources.com. But here's the deal. It is truly a movement. It is a worldwide phenomenon. We'll be the first company to have a million agents. Well, no one's ever done it because we're the only company that makes their agents shareholders. Nobody's doing that like we are, not even close. And nobody's sharing revenue with their agents at the level we're doing it. There's a few minor companies out there poking it with a stick. But we're already a multi-billion dollar national company and we're, we're like, one percent. I mean, if you uh, uh, thirty six thousand of of two point three million. What is that? What is that? Uh, uh, the market percentage? It's just over one percent market penetration in the U.S. I think mathematically. I got to look at those numbers, but it's going. They well, well, you know, we're all about selling real estate. My organization will close. Well, I did some quick numbers and mathematics. I think I'll close forty one thousand residential home sales this year. 41,000 throughout the U.S. and Canada and Australia and the U.K. where we currently operate. I'm not counting South Africa or Mexico or um, India. And India is next week. I'm not even counting that stuff. 41,000. We sell real estate. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, it's funny that people say EXP is all about recruiting and not selling real it's estate. Ridiculous. It is, it's ridiculous. We, it's, we wouldn't be a $3 billion company. Well, what yeah. else are you going to say if you're trying to compete with EXP, yeah. honestly? I mean, yeah. if, you're, if you're a broker and you're losing, seeing your agents leave be going to EXP, I mean, you're kind of – they used to say things like, well, it's just a recruiting business. Well, except that in most markets you're seeing EXP agents and you know become the number one most dominant teams. Well, it's just the stock. What about the st- – well, let's so, see. I'll give you an example. Stock started this year at what, 6 bucks, 8 bucks, and right. now it's traded the 50s i mean it's okay you know yeah 
But if you leave Coldwell Banker for Keller Williams, they're, gonna, they're not going to go, that is, thank God you found Keller Williams. Let us help you pack up your desk. They're going to tell you every reason why you need Coldwell Banker. Keller Williams is one for lawyers, and we're going to protect you if you get in a lawsuit. You're probably going to get in a lawsuit. Or whatever it is, Coldwell Banker is going to try to tell you why it's a bad idea to go to Keller Williams. When I left Remax and went to Keller Williams, or I know at Keller Williams, they're threatened by Realty One, at least in Sacramento. They have hundreds of agents, hundreds and hundreds that used to be at Keller Williams. And they're like, no, Remax. Realty wants just a, a chop shop, you know, it's just 400 bucks a deal and there's no help. Well, I don't know, I've seen a lot of agents that are pretty happy. But it, so it doesn't matter whatever brokerage you work at, if you say, look, I'm leaving Coldwell Banker for Sotheby's, the management team at Coldwell Banker is going to tell you why it's a bad idea. Stop listening to your franchise owner, your sales manager, about whatever company you want to go to, whether it's EXP or some other company, and go check out that other company and give it a shot. If you don't like it, you can always go back to whatever company you came from. So it's not just EXP. Be willing to put your chin on the line and succeed and try things. Yeah, I mean, exactly. And it, Getting back to what you said and the previous point I was making about that trip in San Antonio, and then you said something that was really elegant. Uh, in most brokerages, they manipulate you through your ego. They mm-hmm. give you awards. They give you plaques. Yep. And, and they basically, those, that's how they get you hooked. And your, your ego is constantly looking for that sense of recognition. Well, you get plenty of recognition and love at EXP, but you get something that's everlasting that's more important. You get financial security. You get freedom. You get the opportunity to create legacy wealth. And Julie and I, when we sold real estate for Remax, and I'm sure you as well for Remax and Keller Williams, I mean, what, do you still have all your plaques? No, I, when I get them, I smile, take a picture, throw it in the trash. <laughs> exactly. I but I mean, that, that's the difference. And Glenn recognized that, having been a successful agent himself. He said, well, you know what really pe- agents need is they need financial security. They, I'm going to create something that no one's ever done before. And I'm going to essentially re-jigger you know, the, the brokerage business model. And as a result of that, I'm going to create a bunch of agent millionaires, anyone that's willing to listen. So here's what people say. They go, but you know, it's not about money. It's about the culture. I love the culture at my office. Kel Williams has been the number one company for creating that, the value proposition of culture. And culture is important. And, and, and then my friends, all my friends, I can't leave my friends. Um, do you go to work to hang out with your friends? Do you leave your children for your friends um, for culture? Or do you go to work in real estate to make money for your family? What is it? And, and you think, well, no, it's more important that I have good culture and friends. I don't know about you, but I go to work to earn money for my family. I love my customers and I'll work. I'll do my best to work harder than you for my customers and to retain not only my customers, but to pick up your customers. I want to add so much value to the customer experience, but listen to me. It, it becomes about you leave your kids, some of you at daycare, I hope it's not just about the culture. Yes, culture is important. But that's how yes, they're being manipulated. Are We're yes, doing the same thing. My, yes. They're being manipulated. I'm, I'm and agents, agreeing with and you. And agents don't realize that. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and they, they're treating brokerages like cults. But the, how about this? The like culture, religion. The culture at XP is amazing. They're all the people who are positive, goal-oriented. I can do it. They're the dreamers. EXP is full of dreamers, not well, crazy, what, insane what people. What are three things we talked about this? Although I right. sound a little crazy insane today. Yeah, well, God bless you for that. Yes. So what are the three things that every, every man or woman needs in their life? We talked about this, right? Love. Uh, well, don't don't step on my point now. Oh, sorry. Yeah, now you're going to make me not remember. Okay, right? I thought you were asking me. Uh, no, well, okay. Well, love was the third one. Right? I don't remember. So, so <laughs> something something to do, someone to love, and something to look forward to. There you go. Those are three of the essence of what it is. And what a lot of people do, and you guys, and we've seen this before. And I think even I, I remember when Julie and I had a whole bunch of way too much attention our first year after selling all those houses. We definitely we never had that much attention before. Give me a break. So you had respect, admiration. Oh yeah, but we were. Being being manipulated because we were then wanting, we then started to get addicted to that recognition. That feeling. We were speaking at different Remax offices. Howard made us a star. You know, Julie and I are this little obscure couple from Central Ohio, and all of a sudden we're on this national, you know, real National Association of Realtors magazine. It was a lot of attention, and we weren't ready for it. And so we we hadn't realized, which I realize now, was we just became the marionettes for something else to basically line somebody else's pockets. Yep. They were hoisting us up because basically they were trying to manipulate us through our ego to essentially uh, better their position. Oh, and it, yeah. t- it took me a while to realize that too. Yeah, but once but- I did, then I started realizing I don't want to be on any of these lists anymore. Julie and I didn't want to be on the top this or that. The other li- Matter of fact, Remax had, and I feel bad about this to be honest with you, but Remax had uh, organized some really special uh, awards banquet celebration for Julie and I because we had accomplished some big, huge, I don't even remember what it was. 
It was like two after platinum, if you remember from your Remax days. Yeah. And, and, and Chairman's we, Award. Whatever it was. Platinum, sure. And, and we'd made a decision not to go to those banquets anymore. Yeah. And we found out afterwards that they had basically had planned something really special for us. But the reason we didn't want to go is because we were fearful we'd get sucked back into the ego vortex again and wanting recognition. Right. And we didn't want to move away from what, what our principal goal was, was basically to take care of our customers, have the business be very profitable, reinvest the money, Right. And that's the thing that I, I, can, I sense within the core DNA of this company, Glenn gets that too. There's, not a, there's no manipulation like there is in those traditional brands. They're, they're actually, you guys are, if you're associated with a normal brand and you're just working towards selling more houses so you can get another level of recognition, at the cost of your, let's just be honest, business and personal life, you've been manipulated. You've been co-opted. You, you, your future has been stolen. And then what's going to happen? Decades are going to pass. You know, it's, you know, I'll tell you, you must relate to this because you're just a little bit older than me. But it is funny because for the longest time, Julie and I were always the youngest people in the room. And now, not so much. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right, right. It's funny. It's, you can see this yeah. batons being passed, but that's kind of an interesting experience, isn't it? I hate that experience, actually. I, I do. A little I, bit. I do and I don't. I, I would if I wasn't where I was financially. Yeah. If I wasn't where we are financially, then I would hate it. But, I, yeah. but I'm okay with it. Today, this, I'm the oldest guy in the room, usually. <laughs> uh, actually, I think your wife, you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, there's only three of us here. But I, I think another really important p- m- a point to make as we wrap this up is this. A lot of people listening right now are like, yeah, but Tim can make it. Brent can make it. But only a few people. Your management team, the ownership group, if you work for an independent, whoever owns that independent, but you're putting their name on your listings. You know, they're saying, yeah, but only a few people really make it big at that. I'm telling you right now. I know hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people just in my own organization that the revenue share from EXP makes their house payment. That's making And to it. eliminate your house payment is huge. Yep. And so here's, but, but here's what they're going. Well, what about the rest? What about the rest? Well, the average agent sells six homes a year. What does that got to do with you or the price of tea in China? Yeah, it's an 80-20 rule. I, I would say 80% uh, EXP doesn't make their house payment. Aha, he said it. No, 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 no. You know why? Because they haven't attracted anyone to the company. Because they're just—you don't have to attract people or recruit people. You can actually just sell real estate. So if you're not attracting people, you don't get revenue share, but you get stock. I have so many people that have attracted like nobody who have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars with stock. And I've asked them if we had stayed at our old brokerage, what would you have? They go trophies and plaques. Yeah, trophies and plaques. You don't get profit sharing there either. You have to attract people to get profit sharing, right? And so um, they're so glad. So. Yeah, I have people who they don't make a lot in revenue share, but they have 250, 300, 350, 400,000 worth of stock. They're the ones who did both sold and attracted agents. I have sold so many estate. who have over a million, yeah. a million dollars of stock plus the revenue share. That only makes their house payment, makes their car payments, their second home payment, investment, retire younger. It's unbelievable. Donate it's the money. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Yep. So no, stop it. You're again, you're you're defeated before you even start. You're arguing for your limitations and say, tell me what you know what I'm gonna give it a shot. I don't know if I'll make it. I didn't know if I was gonna make it. I thought, well, maybe I could do ten or fifteen the first year. Uh, I only did it Friday afternoons from two to five. That's right. I make a few calls, and then eight months later, I did 40. Now, Tim, he's more talented than me. He just said, put his mind to it. Boom, 40 in the first month. It may take you two years. I don't care how long it takes you. Well, we had an unfair advantage, our podcast. This yeah. is the number one listen to daily podcast. See, but I don't I don't think that was unfair. You had worked hard all those years to oh, develop yeah. that. I know. So I'm but, not going to call it unfair. You were not an overnight success. No. You were, how long have you been at this real estate gig? Thir- 25 years? Yeah, like 26 or 27. He's a 27 year overnight success. Right? So it's not yeah. an unfair advantage. These we water snappers, we, we are you so have only been doing, yeah. I'm new. Yeah, you may have to take four, five, six, seven years to do what we did in two or three years. What's wrong with that? There's a finish line at eXp. There is no finish line where you work. There isn't. Buy a franchise. Ask them what Build they the net. Team. Ask That's them a... how much money they make with the right, franchise. Exactly. Kelly Williams tried to retain me. They go, our average franchise is now making, I think they told me, 225000 a year. I'm making, really? Have 200 agents? Babysit all those personality and cat fights and all the infighting at the office and so-and-so and deal with all that to make a poultry two twenty five? Are you kidding me? I was definitely out the door. I assumed everyone who owned a franchise I'd made a million dollars. And so, you know, it's a crack up. And, and the average funny. Keller Williams office, according to uh, someone we both know, uh, it's, it's 165 a month in overhead too. 165,000. Yeah. 
That's that's a little chunk oh, of change. So I'm going to tell you a funny story, and then we're around the bend. Um, I got a uh, this my week's blend, but it was either we're not picking on Keller Williams. I just came no, no. from Keller Williams. Keller you came great. from Remax. We're not picking yeah. on Remax. So yeah. no, we're not. Absolutely not. So uh, I get a email or a text that I don't remember from someone that um, Julie and I sponsored maybe 18 months ago, right? And the email was, Tim, EXP sent me money for the last three months or something like that that's like over $2,000. They'd done it before, but it was hundreds of dollars, and I didn't. I just thought it was trailing commissions or something. But this month, it was like $2,800. And, and, and they'd never logged into Enterprise. They did not know where the revenue sh- uh, button was. They didn't know actually how to check what the revenue share was. They didn't know how many stock, how, what, their, what they had in stock awards. So I called them up, and I did a quick Zoom demo and showing how much they were. They, they had uh, mostly by accident sponsored like eight agents or whatnot, and they didn't realize that that eight agents had multiplied to what it had multiplied to and they were actually making revenue and they didn't know how much money they had in stock they hadn't been paying attention to it wow now that was a fun call oh yeah <laughs> i get that call all the time too it's yeah. crazy is it hilarious though? I, love, I love this company it, it's so great and you know if you think if you want to create a thousand dollars a month passive income and you want to do it the traditional way it is to buy rental properties basically and to make a thousand dollars a month you have to basically have a rental property that's going to cost you around two hundred thousand dollars in today's market someplace probably in the midwest or north carolina or south carolina or whatnot no expenses against it. it's going to make and you pay cash for it you're going to make about a thousand dollars a month from it i know this because julie and i have a lot how of many them. people i know you guys do it, but how many we, people out there pay cash for no, a no, fraction no, or exactly yeah but that's my point so most agents have in the back of their mind that they're going to buy rental properties and live off the cash flow, but they never do because they realize that rental properties are not a great place to make net cash flow, especially with the tax laws changing. At eXp, you can get into eXp. You can essentially scale out your plan for the next, you set it perfectly, for the next 12 to 24 months. Produce, you know, have a specific plan, set aside specific time, follow a proven path. Don't come in and try to create your own, you know, way forward. Copy what other people have done and then add every single month try to maybe your goal personally i would say your minimum should be one a month some of you might be daunted by that so maybe you're just going to sponsor five people for year for the next five years i've seen demoed i don't want to talk about the numbers necessarily but five people a year at the end of five years jeans napkin presentation if you have 25 qualifying agents you will be making tens of thousands of dollars per month if all you do is five per year then after five years you have 25 people that are qualifying these are this is the type of growth that this company is seeing you can't do that with rental properties unless basically you fall into some big windfall of cash and that's the other miracle that glenn has given us anything you'd want to say i'll let you round it up man just uh, i'm so grateful to be at exp and i'm so grateful for all of you listening today hopefully we've said things that have inspired you just to go be better at life to be better agent broker associate whatever if you want to know more about exp uh, uh tim said it best you can go to the model explained.com and watch me kind of run through about a 30 minute benefits webinar by the way we have health care for agents now you buy it at a massive discount um and then there's another way to get a short video uh texted how does that work text exp to 31996 and you can do that right now just text exp to 31996 and you'll be texted back 11 minute video and then just watch the video and if you're ready to uh, have you know take the conversation forward let us know and let's talk about you know it's it's a good fit for all of you um and then guys listen this is he said it perfectly again of course he did he's brent gove is it gove no, I'm sorry. People sometimes say that. Oh, okay. It's funny. I'm kidding. I'm okay. kidding. Remember, we're going back two hours ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. I'm trying to round. This is called closing the loop. Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> so I'm trying to close. The, the coffee's loop. wearing off. I'm tired. Oh, we got to yeah, wrap this I up, can Tim. Tell. <laughs> I can tell. Oh, let's go to dinner. <laughs> All right. So yes, let's do go to dinner. Um, so listen, I really appreciate it. And you hey, you came to when Julie and I started our group called Libertas. Yep. This was in April of 2019. I remember. I didn't know you. You flew out to Austin from California, and you helped Julie and I get our revenue share uh, business launched, in yep. which I will forever be beholden to you, which I've said to you before, which you constantly reject, but I'm still going to say it to you, because you are inspirational for Julie and I, you know, and many other people were as well. And, and guys, the, tr- please truly take this opportunity seriously. You know, realistically, the window is open for quite a while to come. But wouldn't you like to basically make it so that maybe 24 months or 36 months from now, you know, it's it's a great thing. You remember 
Forrest Gump, the movie. Right. Okay, so Forrest is sitting on the bench, and he's talking to different people sitting next to him. And he's talking. It's the whole box, life is a box of chocolates thing where he led to. Do you remember when he was showing the Time Magazine thing? And he was talking about Sergeant Dan. Do you remember this? I, it, I never saw the movie, actually. Oh, okay. I'm well, the only so, person who's never seen it or ordered from Amazon. Okay. Just, never mind. Okay. <laughs> so I won't tell you how podcasts work, all right? But anyway, so, <laughs> so he, he's sitting on this, this bench. And he's talking to this lady that sits next down to him. He's, he's got this real heavy, you know, southern accent. And he goes, he goes, uh, well, and then, you know, we made all this money in the, you know, Bubba Gump shrimp business. And then Sergeant Dan reinvested it in some fruit company. And then he shows, uh, and he goes, and lo and behold, it, you know, I'm a gazillionaire. And the lady sitting next to him gets up and walks off. And then Forrest pulls out of his satchel. He pulls out of a Time Magazine cover where it shows uh, basically, a, you know, Apple. You know, so basically Sergeant Dan had invested in Apple that made it. So, and then he goes, then he goes, uh, well, that's one less thing. In other words, he was saying worrying about money was one less thing, right? Nice. That's one less thing. So maybe move forward with these ideas. And, and guys, listen, thank you for keeping this the number one uh, Listen to Daily podcast. And thank you for all the five, you know, that's now over 400 five-star reviews of our book on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and everywhere else. If you guys need us for anything, reach out. Thank you for listening. This officially is our longest podcast by six minutes. I love it. Yes, I was trying to break a record. You did it. I knew you could hang it with me. It took moving to the Caribbean to do it, baby. And caffeine. Don't yep. discount coffee. Caffeine. All right. God bless all of you. This program has been a presentation by Tim and Julie Harris, Real Estate Coaching. For more information on our real estate coaching and training programs, visit our website at timandjulieharris.com. Remember to tune in weekdays at noon for upcoming shows. And until next time, thank you for listening to Real Estate Coaching Radio with Tim and Julie Harris. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.